all right so a very good evening everyone so this is the third day of the rapid revision or the third part of the rapid revision so i am myself dr rajesh gubba i am the general medicine educator so in the previous sessions like we have discussed cardiology endocrinology and yesterday we have discussed neurology and nephrology and today like we will be discussing two important topics one is connective tissue disorders and the other one is the pulmonology and thirdly like some topics in cardiology have been left out and even that particular topics like rheumatic fever coronary artery disease and pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade even those topics i'll be covering in today's session okay right so totally three topics like connective tissue disorders pulmonology and remaining topics or remaining part of the cardiology and the pdf or the ppt of these particular sessions have already been shared on to your telegram channel that is dr bhanu prakash uh, telegram channel and as well as my telegram channel that is medicine made easy by dr rajesh right so the first topic like that we will be starting is the connective tissue disorders and what are all the topics that i'll be revising in the connective tissue disorders are like these are all the topics like vasculitis system lupus erythematosus and in vasculitis i'll try to cover all the types of vasculitis that is large medium and as well as small vessel vasculitis rheumatoid arthritis ankylosing spondylitis bhaisets reactive arthritis jogren syndrome pyroderma then gouts and then apla syndrome so these are all the topics like that we'll be covering in the today's uh, rapid revision of the connective tissue disorders so the first topic that we'll be starting is the vasculitis yeah uh, himanshu right uh, yes himanshu patel i'll send you uh, one more uh, another pdf with annotations which was there completely so don't worry about that so immediately after the class the, uh, i have seen your message on telegram channel also so i'll share that particular pdf with annotations of the entire neurology pdf okay right so having said this now let us start the discussion with the vasculitis in the connective tissue disorders so if you see this question which of the following is not a large vessel vasculitis the options are giant cell arthritis takayasu arthritis idiopathic cutaneous vasculitis and bisset syndrome so anyone want to make an attempt of this question right so if you see this question it is the idiopathic cutaneous vasculitis hmm? very good monica so it is idiopathic cutaneous vasculitis which is the small vessel vasculitis now let me just tell you the examples of all the forms of vasculitis Now you take the large vessel vasculitis. The examples of the large vessel vasculitis that includes Takayasu arthritis and then the giant cell arthritis and then Bhaisets. But if you take this Bhaisets, it can be both. It is either medium vessel vasculitis or large vessel vasculitis. Then followed by that we have the medium vessel vasculitis. The examples of medium vessel vasculitis they include polyarthritis nodosa. Then followed by that we have the Wegener's granulomatosis. then the burgers disease right and this particular i am very sorry one second so polyarthritis nodosa burgers which is also called thromboangitis obliterans and then kawasaki disease right and what are the examples of the small vessel vasculitis the examples of the small vessel vasculitis that includes wegener's granulomatosis then chuck strauss syndrome next microscopic polyangitis and then the hinon shollins purpura so this is how we classify the vasculitis depending upon the vessels which are being involved now you also need to know what is the most common vasculitis in children so please remember the most common cause of vasculitis in children will be hinon shollins purpura it is not your kawasaki disease but this hinon shollins purpura is not only seen in uh, children it is also seen in adults and what is the second most common cause of vasculitis in children that will be your kawasaki disease but this kawasaki let me tell you it is most commonly seen in children very rarely hardly like uh, 1 to 5% you see that in adults but most commonly it is seen in children which one the kawasaki disease now you need to know what is the most common cause of vasculitis in adults the most common cause of vasculitis in adults that will be idiopathic cutaneous vasculitis right this will be the most common cause idiopathic cutaneous vasculitis right so this will be right so this will be the most common cause of vasculitis in adults right it is not your giant cell arthritis it is your idiopathic cutaneous vasculitis then followed by that we have the giant cell arthritis okay now the other way by which the vasculitis can be classified is based on 
the type of inflammation. So in certain vasculitis, you have granulomatous inflammation and in some, you have the non-granulomatous inflammation. Now, what is that vasculitis where you have granulomatous inflammation is, that is, giant cell arthritis, Takayasu arthritis, then Wegener's granulomatosis, which is a small vessel vasculitis, then Churkstra's syndrome. These are all the vasculitis where you have granuloma formation. Right? What is that you have non-granulomatous, uh, what are the conditions where you have non-granulomatous vasculitis that you come across in patients with polyarthritis nodosa, then Kawasaki disease, next microscopic polyangitis and then Kinon Schollin's patella. So these are all the conditions where you will have the non-granulomatous vasculitis. Now, in case of vasculitis, the another important classification is the type of the antibody, right? So, just one minute. Right. So, you should be aware of the antibody, okay? So, we have Pianka and as well as right and as well as the Cianka. So, these two are the antibodies. So, what exactly is your Anka that is anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibody? Now, where exactly is the target antigen of the Pianka? So, Pianka and Cianka are antibodies. Antibodies means they have, they have to be formed against a target antigen. So, uh, the target antigen for your P anchor, the word P stands for perinuclear region. And what is the target antigen there? It is myeloperoxidase. Whereas you take C anchor, the localization of uh, the target antigen in case of C anchor, the word C stands for the cytoplasm. <coughs> right? The word C stands for cytoplasm. Now, what is the target antigen for the C anchor? That is proteinase 3. Right? That is proteinase 3. So, myeloperoxidase for your P anka and for C anka it is the proteinase 3. Now, what are the associated conditions? You take C anka, you see this only in one condition that is vaginal granulomatosis. But P anka it is present in multiple forms of vasculitis that is in case of microscopic polyangitis which is a small vessel vasculitis, then Churkstra syndrome which is also a small vessel vasculitis. And apart from that, even in case of idiopathic crescentic glomerulonephritis also you have this Pianka being positive. Now, these are the various ways by which you can classify the vasculitis based on the size of the vessel, based on the type of the inflammation, based on the antibodies. Now, followed by that, let us try to discuss the individual forms of the vasculitis. So, if you see this question, a 24-year-old female presents with the abdominal pain, hematuria and as well as the arthralgia. On examination, palpable purpuric rash was seen on trunk, limbs and as well as buttocks. The coagulation tests were normal. What is the most probable diagnosis in this patient? The options are hemolytic uremic syndrome, Hinon-Schollin's purpura, meningopoxemia, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Now, so if you classically observe here, like the individual is having abdominal pain, hematuria, arthralgia and then palpable purpura is there. So, all these are suggestive of the Hinon-Schollin's purpura, that is HSP. Now, HSP, let me discuss that in detail. It is a form of the small vessel vasculitis. And this HSP it is characterized by a triad. Now, the another name for your Hinon Schollin's purpura is this is also called as anaphylactoid. Right? This is also called as the anaphylactoid purpura. Now, what is the tetrad in case of the Hinon Schollin's purpura? What did I tell you? It is the most common cause of vasculitis in children, but it can also occur in adults. Now, the word H in case of the uh, HSP stands for the hematuria, right? The word S stands for skin involvement. And what will be that skin involvement? That is palpable purpura, right? Palpable purpura. And the word P stands for pain, right? So, where exactly you can have the pain? That is pain within the joints and as well as pain within the abdomen. So, these are the four important manifestations, hematuria, palpable purpura, pain in the joints and as well as pain in the abdomen. Now, in these anaphylactoid purpura, what is the antibody, right? The most common class of antibody which is being deposited in the immune complexes is the IgA, right? So, in the immune complexes, what you have is IgA. Now, when you are having this purpura, don't anticipate that the patient might be having thrombocytopenia, no. Right? So, these patients, they'll have normal platelet count. Right? In fact, there may be even thrombocytosis also. Then why is this particular purpura? The purpura is mainly because of the cutaneous vasculitis. That is the reason why you have this palpable purpura. 
Now, what is the investigation of choice in case of the Henon Schollings particular? That is the skin biopsy. Now, what does the skin biopsy show in case of Henon Schollings particular? That will show you the presence of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Right? Leukocytoclastic vasculitis. That is the investigation of choice in case of Henon Schollings particular. Then, what is the drug of choice in case of Henon Schollings particular? That will be the steroid, that is, the prednisolone is being given. Now, whenever you are talking about the pain within the joints, let me tell you which particular joints are commonly affected here. <clears throat> so, it is mainly the joints of the lower limbs, right? That two large joints of the lower limbs are commonly affected in case of the Henon Schollings particular, right? Whereas, if you take in case of rheumatoid arthritis, it is the small joints of the upper limbs which are commonly affected in case of the rheumatoid arthritis, okay? So, the drug of choice is your prednisolone and the dosage of the prednisolone, it is around 1 to 2 milligrams per kg per day, right? And this uh, prednisolone, uh, you have to give for a longer period of time and later, you can taper the uh, prednisolone. But the only point is, whenever the individual is having like severe form of disease, where the individual is unable to tolerate the prednisolone, then what are the alternative therapies? The alternative therapies, what we have is rituximab and as well as the plasma exchange. Now, by doing plasma exchange, what is the advantage is that the immune complexes containing that IgA will be taken out by your plasma exchange. And what is the other alternative drug in case of severe form of the disease? That is your rituximab. Next to the prednisolone, the next important drug will be the rituximab. And yes, so this is the palpable purpura, right? This is the palpable purpura. And you have to understand the distribution of this palpable purpura. So most commonly, this palpable purpura they are being distributed over the buttocks and as well as the lower limbs. This will be the distribution of the palpable purpura, right? So, with this, we are done with one form of small vessel vasculitis, that is Henon Schollings purpura. Now, once we are done with the HSP, right? Next, let me take up the discussion of the Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki, what did I tell you? It is the medium vessel vasculitis. Which one of the following is the treatment of choice in case of Kawasaki disease? Cyclosporin, Dapsone, intravenous immunoglobulin. Methotrexate. Yes. Anyone want to make an attempt of this question? Yes. Very good. So, the drug of choice for Kawasaki disease, it is the intravenous immunoglobulin. Now, this Kawasaki disease is that like which is very commonly seen in children, right? So, I'll just tell you the mnemonic for this Kawasaki disease. So, we are very much aware that the, ch the children, they like usually the cream biscuits and all, right? So, just remember this particular mnemonic, that is cream. So, the very important point in case of Kawasaki is the fever. And this particular fever, it should be there for more than or equal to 5 days. Along with fever, just remember this cream. The, the word C stands for conjunctivitis. And this word is very, very important, non-exudative conjunctivitis. So, in the recent past, a question has been asked. Which among the following is not the feature of the Kawasaki disease, right? There was a clinical scenario and which among the following is not the feature of the clinical scenario. One of the point, one of the option was exudative conjunctivitis, right? So, now if you just remember only conjunctivitis, there is high chance that you may land up in trap. So, you have to remember very clearly it as non-exudative conjunctivitis. Then, <clears throat> even rash. Rash also, it is not monomorphic rash. It is polymorphous rash. That means this particular rash which is present in various parts of our body and variable shapes as well. And all over the body, there will be edema within the individual and adenopathy. That cervical lymphadenopathy is very important. And that too, it is not symmetrical cervical lymphadenopathy. It is unilateral. This is very, very another import, important point. So, it is not symmetrical. It is unilateral cervical uh, lymphadenopathy. Okay. And mucosal involvement will be there. That is in the form of erythema or fissuring or crusting. So, right. So, this is the image of the individual with the Kawasaki disease. So, fever should be definitely there and non-exudative conjunctivitis, then the cervical lymphadenopathy, rash, that is polymorphous rash, then the presence of edema and then the mucosal involvement, right, and then mucosal involvement. Now, if you see the treatment, in acute stage, we give intravenous immunoglobulin along with aspirin. But in case of convalescent stage, uh, when the disease CBRT is reducing, the intravenous immunoglobulin will stop and then we give only the aspirin at a dosage of 3 to 5 milligrams per kg once daily orally until 6 to 8 weeks illness onset. So, that is during the convalescent phase. Now, this mucosal involvement is very, very important. That is, 
in case of kawasaki disease like you have what is called a strawberry tongue right so this is how the strawberry tongue doesn't look like this is an animated image right but what you have to remember is that strawberry tongue is one of the important manifestation in patients with the kawasaki disease now i just want to ask you a quick question that in kawasaki what type of strawberry tongue you will have so is it like a red strawberry tongue or is it the white strawberry tongue so what is that you will have in case of the kawasaki disease any one of you yes okay so you take this uh, kawasaki disease the strawberry tongue that you will have is the white strawberry tongue then what is the condition where you will have the red strawberry tongue the red strawberry tongue you will have that in case of the scarlet fever it is seen in case of the scarlet fever and there are many strawberries and this is like one of the fancy question which has been asked in the recent past right so these are all the strawberries in medicine and we have few more strawberries i'll just discuss about them now you take the strawberry nose so strawberry nose it is present in rhinosporidiosis right whereas the strawberry gingiva it is present in the vaginal granulomatosis or granulomatosis with angiitis then strawberry cervix it is present in the trichomonas vaginalis and strawberry gallbladder it is present in cholesterolosis okay so these are some of the strawberries and apart from that we have few more strawberries what are all those so strawberry tongue we have discussed that is kawasaki and as well as scarlet then strawberry gingiva i have said you that is vaginalis strawberry nasal mucosa right this is an add on point that is seen in patients with the sarcoidosis strawberry nose we have discussed that is rhinosporidiosis strawberry gallbladder cholesterolosis that also we have discussed but strawberry shaped skull right you can see that the strawberry shaped skull that you come across this in case of the edward syndrome and where is that you have the strawberry nevus that is in case of the capillary hemangioma strawberry vagina we have just discussed or strawberry vagina or strawberry cervix and strawberry lesion of recto sigmoid junction that is seen in infection of the spirochetes or the bacillus so these are all the strawberries like what we come across in medicine right so having discussed about the we have discussed renal insolvency purpura we have discussed kawasaki disease now we'll move on to the next important form of the vasculitis so you see the clinical scenario a 20 year old women presents with bilateral conductive deafness <coughs> palpable purpura on the legs and there is hemoplexus radiograph of the chest shows thin walled cavity in the left lower zone right thin walled cavity in the left lower zone investigation revealed the total leukocyte count of 12000 i'm sorry total leukocyte count of 12000 per cubic millimeter and rbc cast is present in the urine and serum creatinine is 3 mg that means even there is elevation of your serum creatinine as well so what do you think is the most likely diagnosis in this patient hsp polyarteritis zonosa vaginal granulomatosis and then disseminated tuberculosis so what do you think is the correct answer in this question right very good himanshu so this will be the vaginal granulomatosis so vaginal granulomatosis what exactly is this it is a form of small vessel vasculitis right and you have the granuloma formation the word itself tells you it's a granulomatous inflammation and in case of your uh, vaginal granulomatosis the antibody that will be positive is the c anka is being positive now in case of vaginal granulomatosis you need to remember a triad of involvement what is the triad which is involved in vaginal upper respiratory tract lower respiratory tract and there is involvement of the kidney in case of the vaginal granulomatosis now you take this the upper respiratory tract involvement so upper respiratory tract involvement will be in the form of like involvement of nose involvement of ear and as well as the involvement of throat and as well as mouth now what will be the nasal involvement see nasal involvement will be the septal perforation right and thereby there can be collapse of the mouth sorry collapse of the nose and that will give you the characteristic saddle shaped nose <clears throat> right and what will be the ear involvement the ear involvement will be in the form of the conductive deafness right it is in the form of conductive deafness and what will be the throat involvement that is in the form of the strawberry gums so that will be the upper respiratory tract involvement then followed by that lower respiratory tract involvement so because of lower respiratory tract involvement the patient can present with cough hemoptysis and as well as the dyspnea and whenever you do a chest x ray there is a high chance that there, there can be a thin walled cyst or a cavity that can be seen within the lung involvement then followed by that the kidney involvement so kidney involvement it is seen in almost 80 percentage of individuals and this particular kidney involvement it is in the form of crescentric glomerulonephritis 
Now, when, when do you call crescentic glomerulonephritis? That is, within the glomerulus, if you observe, half moon shaped collection of the inflammatory cells, that is the point when we use the word crescentic glomerulonephritis. So, these are the three important organs which are being affected in case of the vaginous granulomatosis. Now, out of all these, the most common will be the upper respiratory tract involvement. That is, your either nose or ear or the throat and gum is being affected. That will be the most common involvement in case of the vaginal granulomatosis. Then, what do you think is the investigation of choice? Is your antibody, that is, the C anka will be positive. Now, what exactly is the drug of choice? So, now, the standard treatment for Severe vaginal granulomatosis is to induce the remission with immunosuppressant drug. And what is that particular immunosuppressant drug that we need to give is? So, we need to give steroids, but only steroids will not suffice in this scenario. Along with steroids, you need to add rituximab or you need to add the cyclophosphamide. So, that is what you have to give in case of the severe disease. Then the another important is the plasma pharesis. Plasma pharesis is sometimes recommended for very severe manifestations of vaginal granulomatosis. Like whenever there is like diffuse alveolar hemorrhage or whenever there is rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, that is the point when the patient may require that is plasma pharesis. Okay, where they will take out this antigen antibody complexes. So this is about your vaginal granulomatosis which is a small vessel vasculitis, right? Now, then you take the another clinical scenario that is a young female, a patient presents with rhinitis not subsiding with antihistaminics, rhinitis not subsiding with antihistaminics along with recurrent hemoptysis and glomerulonephritis. Now, the point is which of the following is not an important differential diagnosis uh, that can be taken into this scenario. Wood passage syndrome, vaginal granulomatosis, microscopic polyangitis, then polyarthritis nodosa. Now, the very, very important is in these patients, the patient is having kidney involvement and as well as lung involvement. So, in case of polyarthritis nodosa, there is no lung involvement, right? There will be never a lung involvement. So, the correct answer here is the polyarthritis nodosa. So, lungs are not involved in polyarthritis nodosa. Now, let me take up the discussion of the polyarthritis nodosa. So, in polyart so polyarthritis nodosa, what did I tell you? It is a form of the medium vessel vasculitis. It is a form of the medium vessel vasculitis. Okay. Now, what will be the skin involvement or cutaneous manifestations in case of the uh, polyarthritis nodosa is that they will have li libido reticularis. You see here. So, what exactly is your libido reticularis? That is the lacy distribution of the cutaneous blood vessels mainly within the lower limbs or buttocks. That is what is called as the libido reticularis. Right. And that will be the cutaneous manifestation. And the other cutaneous manifestations could be in the form of nodules, papules and as well as even ulcer formation can also be there in case of the skin involvement. Now then followed by the vasculitis of the peripheral nerve. So because of the vasculitis of the peripheral nerve, the individual can develop what is called as mononeuritis multiplex. Right, the individual can develop what is called mononeuritis multiplex. Okay, right. Next is the vasculitis of the gastrointestinal tract. So, due to vasculitis of gastrointestinal tract, there can be abdominal pain. That is, postprandial angina will be there. And why is that? That is because of mesenteric ischemia. Right? That is because of mesenteric ischemia. In the sense, there will be vasculitis of your celiac trunk or superior mesenteric artery or the inferior mesenteric artery. Okay? Right? And the other manifestations is there can be even gastrointestinal bleeding as well. Now, what is the associated viral infection? Right. What is the associated viral infection for the development of your polyarthritis nodosa? This is a very, very important question. That will be your hepatitis B. That will be hepatitis B. Then you need to know that there is also vasculitis of the kidney. That is called renal vasculitis. And because of this renal vasculitis, the individual will have decreased renal perfusion. Thereby, there is activation of ROS causing the hypertension. Okay. So, hypertension is mainly because of your renal vasculitis. Then even there is also the joint involvement. But which particular joints are involved? Again, it is the large joints of the lower limbs. Right? Large joints of the lower limbs. And what are the cardiac manifestations in polyarthritis nodosa is that there can be development of the congestive heart failure and as well as the myocardial infarction. Then what will be the CNS manifestation? That will be in the form of the cerebrovascular accidents. That will be in the form of cerebrovascular accidents. Why is that? Because due to decreased perfusion of the blood to the brain. Then what does the biopsy show? See, biopsy in case of polyarthritis nodosa, that will show you that there is non-granulomatous inflammation. So, 
So where do you come across granulomatous inflammation? That is Wegener's, Takayasu and as well as giant cell arthritis. But whereas in case of the polyarthritis nodosa, you have non-granulomatous inflammation. And what is the drug of choice? The drug of choice in case of the polyarthritis nodosa will be the corticosteroids. So corticosteroids, they are the cornerstone of the treatment. Okay. So this completes the discussion of your polyarthritis nodosa, which is a medium vessel vasculitis. Now, the next important form of vasculitis that you need to know is the Churkstra's syndrome. So Churkstra's syndrome is what it is a form of small vessel vasculitis. And what is the type of inflammation that will come across in small vessel vasculitis? That will be necrotizing inflammation. Right, that will be necrotizing inflammation. And what is the ANCA that will be positive in case of the uh, Churkstra's syndrome? That is your P ANCA. So P ANCA will be positive in Churkstra's syndrome and even it can be present in microscopic polyangitis as well. Now what is the mean age group at which you can have the development of the Churkstra's syndrome is around 45 years of age and if you take male to female ratio there is slight female preponderance then compared to that of males that is 1.2 is to 1 is the ratio. Now if you take the clinical features now what do you think is the most common clinical features that you come across in patients with Churkstra's syndrome that is arthritis right so arthritis that is the most common clinical manifestation right and next is what is the second most common manif uh, uh, manifestation in case of Churkstra syndrome that will be development of mononeuritis multiplex right that is development of mononeuritis multiplex so these are the most common manifestations and as well as the second most common manifestation now <clears throat> what exactly is your mononeuritis multiplex this is also called mononeuropathy Right? And it is a type of the peripheral neuropathy. So what exactly happens in mononeuritis multiplex? It happens when there is damage to one, when there is damage to two or more different nerves in the different areas. That is what is called mononeuritis multiplex. Then you should be very much aware of what will be the skin involvement in patients with the Turkstra syndrome. See, the, see what exactly is this? It is a form of the small vessel vasculitis. Now, this skin involvement in these patients will be in the form of the purpura, right? This will be in the form of the purpura. That will be the skin involvement. Then the eosinophil levels, if you take up, right? So there will be peripheral eosinophilia. So the eosinophil numbers are elevated. Now, if you take the characteristic laboratory features, first and foremost, there will be striking eosinophilia where the eosinophil cells will be more than 80 percentage compared to that of the normal. Then there will be evidence of inflammation that is raised DSR, fibrinogen and as well as alpha 2 globulin. The ANCA will be positive in case of Churkstra syndrome that is P ANCA. Right? And this particular P ANCA, uh, so it is formed against what? It is the anti, it is the antibody which is formed against the myeloperoxidase. Okay? So this is about the laboratory manifestations in case of Churkstra syndrome. Now what do you think is the drug of choice? See, the first line drug in case of Churkstra's will be your corticosteroids that will be the first line treatment but this corticosteroids alone they are not given this corticosteroids should be given along with the azathioprine or methotrexate right along with azathioprine or methotrexate this has been shown to have a very good efficacy in mild to moderate diseases whereas you take in moderate to severe form of disease right so in moderate to severe form of disease there you have you know Mepolizumab, which is an interleukin-5 inhibitor, which is an interleukin-5 inhibitor, okay. So, this will be the treatment for your Churkstra's syndrome. So, we are done with the Churkstra's. Now, the another important form of vasculitis is Takayasu arthritis. So, what exactly is your Takayasu arthritis? That will be the large vessel vasculitis and very commonly seen in age group less than 50 years. And if you take the vascular involvement in Takayasu, remember, the most common vessel that will be affected is the left subclavian artery or the subclavian artery is the one which is most commonly uh, uh, affected in Takayasu. Now what will be the vascular symptoms in these individuals? Because of the involvement of the left subclavian artery, the blood supply to the left upper limb will be reduced and thereby the individual will have the absence of pulse in the left upper limb and that we call it as the pulseless disease. And not only that, there will be also reduced blood pressure in the left upper limb than compared to that of right. So, there will be asymmetrical pulse between the two upper limbs and there will be also asymmetrical blood pressure between the two upper limbs. Now, there are many other conditions where you have unequal blood pressure between the right and as well as left arm. One example is your Takayasu arthritis. Next to your Takayasu arthritis, 
the other conditions are the coactation of iota but only thing you need to remember this coactation should be there preductal okay preductal coactation of iota and the other conditions are obstructive artery, iota arteritis supravalvar aortic stenosis and aortic dissection so these are the conditions where you can have unequal blood pressure between the two arms now what will be the clinical manifestations see because of the involvement of subclavian artery the blood supply to the upper limb will be reduced and thereby the patient will present with arm claudication right the patient will present with the arm claudication right so whenever the individual start doing some work with the upper limb he'll, he or she will have pain and after taking rest the pain will disappear and that is what is called as the arm claudication right and the other vessels which can get affected is there can be involvement of common carotid artery due to which there can be visual changes there can be even focal attack and cerebrovascular accident and there can be involvement of abdominal aorta because of which there will be severe abdominal pain and there can be involvement of renal artery causing renal artery stenosis causing the activation of RAS resulting in hypertension and vertebral vessels are also affected and thereby the individual will have right thereby the individual will have the posterior column manifestations because the vertebral vessels are the one which will give the posterior column manifestation like visual changes can be there and as well as dizziness so, but the most common vessel which is being affected is the left subclavian artery in case of takayasu and you need to be very much aware of what is the most common variant of takayasu one two three four can anyone tell me which particular type of takayasu is more common in india right which particular type of takayasu is more common in india anyone so the type of takayasu that is more common in india that will be your type 3 so what does this type 3 constitutes so type 3 it constitutes both so type 1 and type 2 together we call it as type 3 now what exactly is your type 1 type 1 is that where there is involvement of arch of iota and its branches so this will be type 1 then what is your type 2 type 2 is that where there is involvement of thoraco abdominal aorta and its branches with or without being involved okay so there will be involvement of the thoraco abdominal iota that will be your type 2 whereas you take in type 3 in type 3 you have the manifestations of 1 and as well as 2 that will be your type 3 that means there is involvement of your arch of iota and as well as thoraco abdominal iota as well and that is what is most common in india whereas in type 4 you have the pulmonary artery involvement and in type 5 you have the involvement of the coronary arteries right so these are uh, the various forms of your takayasu but the most common form of takayasu in india that will be your type 3 now how do you work up these patients the esr definitely it will be elevated then whenever you do an iotography that will show you the presence of the osteal narrowing and mri of the iota is considered as the investigation of choice in patients with the takayasu arthritis then what exactly is the drug of choice in majority of the forms of vasculitis the drug of choice will be the steroid that is prednisolone and in those individuals who are refractory to steroids in them you need to give interleukin 6 receptor uh, that is the tocilizumab right that is your tocilizumab so okay these are the treatment options that are available for takayasu right then after having discussed about the takayasu the next important form of vasculitis is the giant cell arthritis so all of the following are true about the temporal arthritis except polymyalgia rheumatica, anemia, low ESR and sudden blindness. Remember when you are using the word arthritis, the marker of the inflammation should be elevated. So they will not have low ESR that is they will have the high ESR. Then what about the next important question? Most common vessel which is being affected in case of the giant cell arthritis, it is nothing but your temporal arthritis and thereby the individual will also have the headache right the individual will also have headache and this particular headache is mostly unilateral right mostly unilateral and there can be also development of visual loss and the visual loss in case of the takayasu that is mainly because of the involvement of posterior ciliary branch of the ophthalmic artery right so visual loss it is due to posterior ciliary branch of ophthalmic artery okay that is one which is responsible for visual blindness now what is the inflammatory marker that will decide the development of the visual loss this is a very very important question and that particular inflammatory marker is the interleukin 6 
Then what are the other visual manifestations? The other visual manifestations can be in the form of the diplopia, right? That can be in the form of diplopia, okay? Right. Next is the polymyalgia rheumatica. This polymyalgia rheumatica, it is present in almost 40% of patients with the giant cell arthritis. What exactly is your polymyalgia rheumatica? It is nothing but the stiffness. And where exactly you have the stiffness? That is within the shoulder girdle, right? And as well as the hip girdle. But most commonly it is within the shoulder girdle where you will have the stiffness in polymyalgia rheumatica. And in polymyalgia rheumatica, you need to be very much aware of the investigation of choice. So what is that you need to do is, or in case of giant cell arthritis, you need to do a biopsy. So whenever you do a biopsy, that will show you the presence of the granulomatous inflammation. Then what is the drug of choice in case of your polymyalgia rheumatica or your giant cell arthritis? Remember, the drug of choice here will be the steroids. Right, the drug of choice here will be steroids. So this is about your giant cell arthritis. So in case of giant cell arthritis, you should remember these criteria. Totally five criteria are there. Out of this, three should be there. Number one, age of the patient should be more than 50 years. There should be or it should be a new onset headache and abnormal temporal artery. That means temporal artery may be containing the granulomatous inflammation. The ESR is being elevated that is more than 50 millimeters per hour. And the biopsy of the vessel is very, very important. That is prominent temporal artery biopsy results from vasculitis, which shows granulomatous inflammation. Right, which shows granulomatous inflammation. So out of these five, at least three should be there to call it as the giant cell arthritis. And what is the drug of choice in case of giant cell arthritis? The drug of choice will be the steroids. There is no uh, other alternative drug. Right, now you see the next question. A 32 year old uh, woman with long standing diagnosis of right, long standing diagnosis of SLE is evaluated by her rheumatologist at a routine uh, follow up. The new cardiac murmur is heard and echocardiogram is ordered. She feels well and have no fever, weight loss and pre-existing celiac disease. Second day is shown, sorry, 2D echo is shown which of the following statement is true in this condition. Yes. Right. So, what exactly is being shown to you here? Right. What has been shown to you is the 2D echo containing the mitral valve. And on the mitral valve, you have that hyperdense lesion, which is nothing but the vegetations. Okay. Which is nothing but vegetations. So, uh, this particular vegetations in case of the SLE, what do we call it as? That is nothing but your Lidman Sachs endocarditis. Right. Lidman Sachs endocarditis. So, what is the correct statement here? The blood cultures are unlikely to be positive. So definitely, what are these? These are sterile vegetations. So the blood cultures are unlikely to be positive, right? That is the correct statement. And glucocorticoid therapy has been proven? No. For Lidman Sachs endocarditis, what you need to do is, you need to do valvuloplasty, right? That will be the treatment for your Lidman Sachs endocarditis. Then pericarditis is frequently the presenting concomitant manifestation? No. Pericarditis is the most common manifestation of your SLE, but it is not present concomitantly. And the lesion has low risk of embolization is a wrong statement. Even this particular lesions, whenever they rupture, once they enter into the systemic circulation, there is high chance of the embolization in these individuals. Now, what is the diagnostic criteria for SLE? So, this is a mnemonic. There are totally 11 criteria. So, out of 11 criteria, if 4 are there, then it is very much diagnostic of the SLE. Right, and what is that particular 11 criteria? Soap, brain, MD. So the mnemonic that you need, can remember is, so you wash your brain with soap, then you will get the MDC. So now what exactly is this soap, brain, MD, right? I'll just tell you one by one. So if the question is being asked, like what is the most common presentation of SLE? Then that will be your fatigue, malaise, fever and arthralgia. That is seen in almost 95% of individuals, fatigue and as well as arthralgia along with fever, right? And this, your fatigue, arthralgia and fever is being followed by the next important manifestation that is hematological and as well as the cutaneous manifestation. Now, let me discuss in detail about the SLE. So, in SLE, like what is the characteristic acute SLE rash? The characteristic acute SLE rash, that will be the malar rash. That will be malar rash, which is also called as the butterfly rash. And what will be the description of this uh, malar rash? So this malar rash, it is erythematous, it is fixed erythema, flat or raised and that is present over the malar eminences and as well as the sun exposed part. Now apart from this, you also have the discoid rash, 
right? You also have the discoid rash. And even your discoid rash, it is also erythematous, circular, raised patch with adherent keratotic scaling, right? So that will be the discoid rash. And the next important skin manifestation can be in the form of photosensitivity. And for the development of photosensitivity, the antibody that you need to know that is Rho or the SSA antibody, right? So, and these patients, like, how do you want the patient to be treated? That is by treatment with the hydroxychloroquine and as well as the sunscreen lotions. And next thing is these ulcers within the oral mucosa, that is the small ulcers which are painless, right? They are superficial small ulcers which are painless. And that will occur over the heart palate, buccal cavity and as well as the vermiform border. Then next is the type of the arthritis. These patients in case of SLE, the type of arthritis that you will have is non-erosive arthritis. So you see this question here, in which of the following condition or arthritis, erosions are not seen. That is non-erosive arthritis. Non-erosive arthritis is seen in patients with the SLE. But not only SLE, two more other conditions where you have non-erosive arthritis is... One is rheumatic fever, then inflammatory bowel disease, then the systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, let me take up the discussion of all the organs which are affected in the SLE, right? So, there is involvement of the kidney, right? So, this particular kidney involvement, okay, what do, what do we describe as, if the question is asked, okay, the, more, the kidney involvement we call it as lupus nephritis. Now, the point is, right, the point is the most common lesion in the lupus nephritis, that will be the wire loop lesion. And these wire loop lesions, they are very commonly seen in, yeah, these wire loop lesions are very commonly seen in class 4 of lupus nephritis. There are totally 6 classes. In class 4, which is also called diffuse lupus nephritis, you get this particular wire loop lesions. Now, what is the cardiac involvement? The cardiac involvement will be in the form of pancarditis. And among this pancarditis, that is pericarditis, myocarditis and endocarditis, the most common uh, will be the pericarditis. And what will be the lung involvement? That will be in the form of interstitial lung disease, pleural effusion. And then these individuals will also have the shrinking lung. Right? These individuals will also have shrinking lung. Then what will be the CNS manifestations? The CNS manifestations will be in the form of the seizures and as well as the psychosis. So the seizures and as well as psychosis is uh, one of the very important area where, where we need to stress upon. Why? Because you have the antibodies which are responsible for CNS manifestations. What are those? I will discuss. Now, what is the shrinking lung syndrome? Shrinking lung syndrome, that is due to diaphragmatic myopathy. The antibodies are formed against the diaphragm and thereby there is increase in the dome of the diaphragm compressing the lung parenchyma and this we call it as the shrinking lung. Right? This we call it as shrinking lung. Right. Then, what are the psychiatric manifestations? Just now we have discussed the, that will be in the form of psychosis. Then, hematological manifestation that can be in the form of pancytopenia. Right. That can be in the form of pancytopenia. Then, you take this APLA syndrome. Almost 50% of patients are having SLE. They have associated APLA syndrome. And because of which the individual is having the recurrent abortion. That is what you, that is what is the classical presentation in case of the APLA syndrome. Now, in case of drug-induced lupus, so what is the most common drug that will be causing lupus is the procainamide, right? That will be the procainamide, okay? So, that will be the most common drug that will be causing the drug-induced lupus, right? So, having said this, yes, you can see the image of the shrinking lung syndrome where you have the diaphragmatic myopathy due to which the right half of the diaphragm is being paralyzed, right? Where the dome of the diaphragm is being elevated, okay? That is one image. Now, the shrinking lung, it is a characteristic feature of what? It is a characteristic feature of the SL, that is systemic lupus erythematosus, right? Next, then you need to be very much aware of, yes, so you see this question, why loop lesions are often characteristic for following class of the lupus nephritis? So, which class is that? That will be your class 4, which is nothing but diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis, right? That, that is where you have this uh, wire loop lesions. Then, followed by that, the antibodies, right? If you take the antibodies, that is a very, very important area in the entire topic of SLE, which condition, which antibodies will be there. Now, let me take up the discussion of the antibodies, right? So, if you take the most sensitive marker of the SLE, the most sensitive marker of SLE will be anti-nuclear antibody, whereas 
you take the most specific antibody. The most specific antibody will be anti Smith antibody. Right? And marker of drug induced SLE that will be anti histone antibody. Right? And antibody responsible for thrombus and recurrent abortion that will be anti phospholipid antibodies. Hmm? That will be the anti phospholipid antibodies. What are those? I will discuss that in detail. Now, then coming to psychosis, the antibody which is responsible for the development of the psychosis that will be anti ribosomal P. <clears throat> right, anti ribosomal P antibody. An antibody which is causing the photosensitivity, just now we have discussed, that is anti rho or the SSA antibody. An antibody causing the CNS lupus, that will be the anti neuronal antibody. Right, anti neuronal antibody, or we also call it as the anti glutamate antibody. Okay, so this is the entire story of the antibody picture in case of SLE. Now, at the same time, you need to know the treatment in patients with the SLE. So, what is the drug of choice for acute episodes? Drug of choice for acute episodes will be methylprednisolone. Then you take this the Libman Sachs endocarditis, which is nothing but the valvular involvement. So, whenever there is valvular involvement that is innermost layer of the heart, there is no role of steroids. So, these patients they require valvuloplasty. Right? APLA syndrome, you need to give aspirin plus anticoagulant like heparin should be given. Photosensitivity, I said you, hydroxychloroquine is one important drug. <clears throat> and then this application of sunscreen lotions. Then the lupus and nephritis with end stage renal disease. That is where these patients they require renal transplantation. Right? And drug of choice for lupus, severe lupus nephritis. Severe lupus nephritis, we give cyclophosphamide. And how do you diagnose? Or I'm sorry. So for psychosis, what is the uh, treatment that you'll be giving? That is haloperidol. Right, that is haloperidol. Then the drug of choice for SLE exacerbation in pregnancy, that will be the hydroxychloroquine. Then in case of the severe lupus cerebritis, in severe lupus cerebritis, that is the point where you need to give dexamethasone. Okay, so this will be the treatment options in case of the systemic lupus erythematosus. Right, uh, just give me two minutes, uh, a break. Right, some technical issue. I'll just be back in one or two minutes. Break.
right so next to this systemic lupus erythematosus right let me take up the discussion of the apla syndrome that is anti phospholipid antibody syndrome so anti phospholipid antibody syndrome the other name which is being given to this is this is also called as the huth syndrome right now uh, in these patients with anti phospholipid antibody syndrome three important antibodies are there and these three important antibodies are the one which are responsible for the development of the hypercoagulability clot formation what are those three antibodies that is the anti cardiolipin antibody then anti beta 2 glycoprotein then lupus anticoagulant these are the three antibodies now the presence of which particular antibody is the one which tells you that there is high risk of the pregnancy losses that is the lupus anticoagulant so more is the lupus anticoagulant value more is the chances of the recurrent abortion okay right and what is the name of the criteria for your apla syndrome that is saparo criteria where you have a clinical criteria and as well as laboratory criteria whatever i have taught you is the laboratory criteria that is three antibodies then what is the clinical criteria there should be vascular thrombosis and then the pregnancy morbidity so pregnancy morbidity what is that you need to have you need to have the recurrent pregnancy loss that is recurrent abortions should be there that is if the individual is like less than 10 weeks the number of abortions should be more than or equal to 3 right more than or equal to 3 consecutive abortions at less than 10 weeks that is one criteria or death of the normal fetus more than or equal to 10 weeks that is another important criteria for pregnancy morbidity okay so and and we have one important terminology in case of this uh, apla syndrome and that is called as right that is called as the Asherman syndrome what is this sorry Asherson syndrome Asherson syndrome that tells you it is a catastrophic anti phospholipid antibody syndrome that is what is called the Asherson syndrome then how do you treat these patients with the anti phospholipid antibody syndrome that is before right before so what the female has to do is before conceiving right she has to be on the aspirin right once the uh, female has conceived then along with aspirin you need to give the anticoagulant hmm? that is the low molecular weight heparin is being preferred okay so this is about your uh, huge syndrome which is also called apla syndrome and remember in patients who are having sle the chance of development of apla syndrome is almost 50 percent but in the normal general population it is just only five percent now after having discussed about the sle the next important is the dermatomyositis and as well as the polymyositis so dermatomyositis this is also one of the connective tissue disorder like where along with skin right along with skin the word derma is skin along with skin there is also proximal muscle weakness right along with skin there is also proximal muscle weakness now in these patients also they have the development of the antibodies right and it is also an autoimmune condition and what are those antibodies i'll discuss that, that in detail and what are the skin manifestations first of all the skin manifestations that includes the heliotrope rash so what exactly is this it is a purple blue rash right which is distributed over the upper eyelids and as well as the majority of the face right and the next important skin manifestation will be the gotrans papules gotrans papules they are nothing but the erythema of the knuckles right erythema of the knuckles that is what is your gotrans papules and the next important is like we have what is called the v sign and the shawl sign so you take this particular wheels v sign what is this v sign where you have erythema or erythematous rash which is present over the anterior surface of the chest and that to upper part of the chest the next is the shawl sign what exactly is the shawl sign that is also the same thing that is erythematous rash exactly being distributed over the shoulders right over the shoulders okay now you need to know one of the differential diagnosis of the v sign and what is the differential diagnosis of the v sign that is called the necklace sign which is seen in case of niacin deficiency that is pellagra now what are the other skin manifestations in dermatomyositis that includes the periangual telangiectasias right periangual telangiectasias which is nothing but the dilated capillaries which are present within the finger nails that is called the telangiectasias and how will be the hand of these individuals this we describe it as the mechanics hand right where you have irregular distorted skin and you also have the multiple cracks over the skin of the hand and not only that the another important skin manifestation is the deposition of the calcium within the skin and that we call it as the calcinosis 
cutis. So these are all the cutaneous manifestations. So I'll quickly recap. So one includes the heliotrope rash, then Gottron's papule, then V sign, Shawl sign, periangual telangiectasia, mechanics sign, and as well as the calcinosis cutis, right? Now, after having discussed about the skin manifestations, you need to be very much aware of the muscle involvement. So, muscle involvement, what did I tell you? It is the proximal muscle weakness. It is the proximal muscle weakness. And dermatomyositis, what is the age group at which you will have dermatomyositis? It is seen in the childhood, right? It is seen in childhood or it is also seen in the adults, okay? Also seen in adults. And in case of this dermatomyositis, there is no familial association. There is no familial association, but there can be extra muscular manifestations in dermatomyositis. What is that extra muscular manifestation? That is nothing but your skin involvement. That is nothing but your skin involvement. Okay, right. So, this is about your dermatomyositis, and you need to be very much aware of the antibodies. You need to be very much aware of antibodies. But before going on to the antibodies, let me tell you these patients with dermatomyositis, they are at increased risk of malignancy in adult patients. Right. So, I said you, it is seen in both adults and children. Dermatomyositis in adults, they are at increased risk of the malignancy. So, what is that malignancy that you will see in adults is, that includes the ovarian cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic, stomach, colorectal and as well as the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So, these are the malignancies most commonly associated with the dermatomyositis, right? Now, you need to be very much aware of the antibodies. Now, what are the what is the difference between dermatomyositis and polymyositis? In dermatomyositis, you have skin involvement. But whereas in polymyositis, there is no skin involvement. It is only the proximal muscle weakness that you have. Now, what are the antibodies? So, as such in case of this polymyositis and dermatomyositis, the antibodies which are being present is the anti-JO1 and as well as the anti-MI2. In case of polymyositis, you have anti-JO1. Right, anti jo one Whereas uh, in dermatomyositis, the antibodies which are being present is the anti-MI2. Right, that will be anti-MI2. And we have one more group of antibodies that is called anti-SRP. This anti-SRP, it is present in both. It is present in both dermatomyositis and as well as the polymyositis. Okay, so these are the antibody profile in case of your polymyositis and dermatomyositis. So definitely what is the first line treatment? It's an autoimmune disorder. So you need to give the prednisolone and the dosage is around 40 to 60 milligrams or more uh, is the prednisolone that you need to give. Now what is the second line agent? The second line agent will be your methotrexate. That means those individuals not tolerating the prednisolone or not responding to prednisolone, in them you need to give methotrexate. And apart from methotrexate, what are the other drugs? That includes azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, chlorambucil and as well as cyclosporin. But please remember the second line agent is the methotrexate. Now, in case of the steroid resistant cases of polymyositis, the another important drug is the intravenous immunoglobulin. Right? Another important drug is intravenous immunoglobulin. So, this completes the discussion of your polymyositis and dermatomyositis. So, the important difference is what? In case of polymyositis, only muscle involvement. Dermatomyositis along with skin involvement, you also have the muscle involvement. And polymyositis, you have to remember that it is mainly seen in children. But whereas dermatomyositis, it is seen both in children and as well as the adults. Okay. And skin manifestations, you don't have in case of polymyositis. Right. Now, now after having discussed about, so what all we have discussed now? Vasculitis, SLE, then uh, APLA syndrome. Next, we have discussed polymyositis and dermatomyositis. Now, let me take up the discussion of the ankylosing spondylitis. Now, if you take this ankylosing spondylitis, right? So, uh, in case of ankylosing spondylitis, you have two important articular manifestations. What is the two important articular manifestations? That is, the number one, involvement of spine, where there will be fusion of the vertebra. And the next important articular manifestation in case of ankylosing spondylitis is the sacroiliac joint where there will be sacroiliitis, right, where there will be sacroiliitis. Now, if you take the spine involvement, the spine involvement will be lower down from above, right. So, initially, there will be fusion of the vertebra of the sacrum, then lumbar, then thoracic, and then the cervical. So, the sacroiliitis, that is a, one of the very, very important manifestations in case of the ankylosing spondylitis. And if sacroiliitis is there, if more than or one 
Spondyloarthropathy feature is there that is more well and good for diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis. But if HLA B27 is there, only one spondyloarthropathy feature is not sufficient. You should have more than two spondyloarthropathy features. Now, this HLA B27 is present in many other conditions apart from the ankylosing spondylitis. Now, can anyone tell me what are the other conditions where you can have HLA B27 apart from ankylosing spondylitis? Yes, any one of you? So, the other conditions where you can have is very good. So, you can have that in case of the psoriatic arthritis, then inflammatory bubble disease then you also have that in case of reactive arthritis hmm? also in, not in rheumatoid arthritis okay it is this is reactive arthritis hmm? right so also called retard syndrome so th these are the conditions where you will have the right these are the conditions where you will have the hla b27 being positive and if only hla b27 is positive how many spondyloarthropathy features should be there more than two now what are all those spondyloarthropathy features you have a mnemonic a b c d e f g and then ip Right. So, what is this pneumonia you see here? A stands for arthritis. B is your B, uh, B27. C is your CRP positive. D is dactylitis. E is enthesitis. F is family history of spondyloarthropathies. G stands for good response to NSAIDs. I stands for inflammatory back pain. P stands for the psoriasis. So, this is what is your ABCDFGH. Okay. Right. So, what are all these? These are all actually spondyloarthropathy features. Hmm? These are all actually spondyloarthropathy features and if sacroiliitis is there more than one spondyloarthropathy feature should be there but if HLA B27 is positive more than or equal to two spondyloarthropathy features should be there okay now in these patients with ankylosing spondylitis apart from joint involvement that is spine and as well as sacroiliac joint there are also extra articular manifestation now what is the most common extra articular manifestation is the uveitis that is the anterior uveitis and cardiac involvement will be there that is in the form of aortic regurgitation, ischemic heart disease and third degree AB block and lung involvement will be there that is in the form of the upper lobe fibrosis of the lung and spine involvement will be there that is in the form of the cauda equina syndrome, GIT involvement in the form of inflammatory bubble disease and skin involvement will be there that is in the form of psoriasis. So these are the extra articular manifestations that you will have in patients with the ankylosing spondylitis. Now, see, how is the vertebra in these individuals? The vertebra is being fused. Now, how? what is the test that you will be using for assessing the vertebral fusion? Any one of you? So, Schober sign is used to evaluate. Yes, the Schober sign is used to evaluate. So, Schober sign is used to evaluate the flexion of the lumbar spine. Right? We will not go into the detail of how the test is being done, but this will assess the flexion of the lumbar spine. Now, you see the imaging in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. So, when you do an x-ray of the spine, you get this characteristic bamboo spine. And why is that you get this characteristic bamboo spine? That is because of the fusion of the vertebra and that is because of the calcification of the uh, spinous ligaments. You get this characteristic bamboo shaped vertebra. Okay. Then, next is the dagger sign. Right. Next is the dagger sign. So, what exactly is the dagger sign? See, dagger sign in case of ankylosing spondylitis, it is nothing but it is the ossification of supraspinous and as well as the interspinous ligaments. Right. The ossification of the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments. That is what is called as the dagger sign. That is very classical and many times it has been asked in the uh, previous years. And next important image is the sacroiliac joint. This is a normal sacroiliac joint, but in ankylosing spondylitis, how will be the sacroiliac joint? This is how the sacroiliac joint will be there. That is, there is development of the sacroiliitis. So, this is about the manifestations in case of ankylosing spondylitis. So, two uh, articular involvement one is spine, then the other one is sacroiliac joint. Okay, and if there is sacroiliitis, more than or equal to one spondylar orthopathy feature is there. Re enough, but for HLA B27 is there, more than or equal to two spondylar orthopathy features should be there. Right. Now, what is the treatment? See, the first line treatment in patients with ankylosing spondylitis will be NSAIDs wherein we give this indomethacin. And those individuals not responding to your NSAIDs, that is NSAID resistant condition, we give this TNF-alpha inhibitors. 
and we have some new drugs which are available for the treatment of ankylosing spondylitis and these new, new drugs are the interleukin 17a inhibitors that includes secuq zumab and then the ixeki zumab so these are the two new drugs which are available for the treatment of uh, the ankylosing spondylitis right so with this we are done with the topic of the ankylosing spondylitis where you have hla b27 being positive now the another important connective tissue disorder that we need to quickly recap is about the sarcoidosis right it is about the sarcoidosis now can anyone tell me what is the type of inflammation that you have in case of sarcoidosis okay so the type of inflammation it will be right it will be granulomatous inflammation <clears throat> And the type of granuloma will be non caseating granuloma. So, what will be the presentation of the patient? So, what is the most common organ which is affected in uh, sarcoidosis? This is a multi system disorder, right? The most common organ which is being affected is lung. And within the lung, what will be the lung involvement? That lung involvement will be in the form of the interstitial lung disease. And very rarely, there can be exudative type of pleural effusion. So, whenever there is interstitial lung disease, the clinical presentation of the patient to you will be in the form of exertional dyspnea. And they can also have dry cough, right? And the other thing that, that, that they'll give you is the uh, investigations are showing that there is hypercalcemia and there is also increase in your ACE levels. So what is your diagnosis there? That is your sarcoidosis. But what exactly is the investigation of choice in case of sarcoidosis? We'll discuss. Now, so what are the pulmonary, pulmonary involvement I have taught you? That is interstitial lung disease. And only in 5% of patients, there can be development of exudative type of pleural effusion. And next to your... Uh, lung involvement the next important is the involvement of the lymph nodes and these patients they will have bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy and this bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy it is a hallmark of the sarcoidosis and along with this uh, hilar lymph node the other important organ that there can be enlarged is the parotid gland enlargement and even the parotid gland enlargement in sarcoidosis will be bilateral parotid gland enlargement next thing is the skin involvement so two important skin manifestations one is your lupus pernio, which is nothing but your purple blues hue around the nose, cheek, lips and as well as the part of ears. That will be your lupus pernio, right? And the another important skin manifestation will be in the form of the erythema nodosum, right? That will be in the form of erythema nodosum. Now, what are the other systems which are being affected? One is lung, lymph node, skin. The other systems are, there can be involvement of eye also, that is in the form of uveitis. Kidney involvement can be there, that is in the form of renal hypercalcemia. Skeletal involvement will be there, that is in the form of arthritis. Nervous system involvement can be there, that is in the form of peripheral uropathy. And cardiac involvement can be there, that is in the form of cord pulmonary. Right? Now, what is the investigation of choice? <clears throat> the investigation of choice in these individuals will be biopsy. And what does the biopsy shows? The presence of granulomatous inflammation. In presence of granulomatous inflammation. So, what does the granuloma contain? The granuloma contains the macrophages and as well as the presence of the giant cells. What are giant cells? They are nothing but the fused macrophages, right? Then next is this. Uh, this is a very very important sign that you need to know. That is Garland striated, which is also called as one two three sign, right? Or another name for this is this is also called as the pawn broker sign right this is also called pawn broker sign so what exactly happens here in this along with bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy right so there will be bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy along with that there is also enlargement of <coughs> right paratracheal lymph node hmm? there is also enlargement of the right paratracheal lymph node okay so this is what is your garland stride hmm? this is what is your garland stride next now if you take the Gallium uptake studies. So, gallium uptake studies, you will have two important signs in sarcoidosis, lambda sign and as well as the panda sign. Now, you take this lambda sign. So, lambda sign is that where you have gallium uptake within the hilar lymph nodes and as well as paratracheal lymph node. Whereas, your panda sign is that where the gallium uptake is there within the lacrimal gland and as well as the parotid gland. Right? And one more important test, it is only of academic importance. This, is, this particular test is not being done now. That is called Queen Silsback test, right? That is Queen Silsback test, right? They can just give you as one of the option which among the following is not the investigation which is not uh, not done in sarcoidosis, right? So they may give you some other question, 
option but queen swings back swings back that might be one of the option this is the investigation which is being done for sarcoidosis but not being used in the present days because we have many other new investigations which have come up with for sarcoidosis right and it's a skin test right i am not going into the detail of the procedure of like how this particular test is being done okay now what is the treatment see the drug of choice in these individuals will be steroids see uh, the sarcoidosis occurs the basic pathogenesis is immune hyperreactivity and you want to suppress that immune hyperreactivity you can give this corticosteroids that is the prednisolone but very much concerning point is in case of the corticosteroid refractory conditions in corticosteroid refractory disease the drug which is most commonly used is methotrexate azathioprine or the infliximab these are the three drugs for corticosteroid refractory disease okay so this is about the completion of the sarcoidosis which is a multi system disorder now we'll move on to the next important topic that is the rheumatoid arthritis right anyone want to make an attempt of this question which of the following hla is specific for the rheumatoid arthritis very good so that is the hla dr4 what is the condition where you have hla dr3 and dr4 which is positive any one of you in which condition you have both hla dr3 and as well as dr4 being positive that is in type 1 diabetes mellitus in type 1 diabetes mellitus you have both hla dr3 and as well as dr4 being positive okay now we move on to a detailed discussion of the rheumatoid arthritis so rheumatoid arthritis it is an autoimmune disease which is more commonly seen in females rather than males and what is the age group that we use see this rheumatoid arthritis that is around 25 to 55 years of age group and what are the joints which are commonly affected in these patients with rheumatoid arthritis the joints which are commonly affected is the small joints right and that particular small joints include that is metacarpophalangeal joints and as well as the proximal interphalangeal joints distal interphalangeal joints are not affected in case of rheumatoid arthritis and the other joints are the involvement of mtp that is metatarsophalangeal joints and how is the uh, nature of this disease it is bilaterally symmetrical disease right it is bilaterally symmetrical disease and what will be this joint manifestation that is early morning stiffness and this early morning stiffness will be there for more than one hour right early morning stiffness will be there for more than one hour and this stiffness it decreases as the physical activity of the individual goes on and this uh, rheumatoid arthritis depending upon the joint involvement see if less than four joints are involved then we call it as monoarticular rheumatoid arthritis and if more than or equal to five joints are affected then we call it as the polyarticular rheumatoid arthritis okay so now these patients with rheumatoid arthritis in long term they can develop deformities and these deformities are swan neck deformity and butternut deformity so swan neck deformity and butternut deformity the joints are exactly opposite in direction that is in case of swan neck deformity right so in swan neck deformity there is hyperextension of proximal interphalangeal joint and there will be flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint whereas in butternut deformity it is exactly opposite there is hyperextension of distal interphalangeal joint and flexion of proximal interphalangeal joint okay so that is what is called butternut deformity or the bottonier's deformity that is what you will see in case of the rheumatoid arthritis and what are the other deformities that you will come across the other deformities are the z shaped thumb right z shaped thumb and the other deformity can be even the ulnar deviation so these are the deformities that you will see within the hand right that is swan neck deformity botanist deformity z line deformity and as well as the ulnar deviation next now uh, okay now very important differential diagnosis for your swan neck deformity will be your mallet finger deformity see in case of mallet finger deformity you have only flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint but the extension of right the extension of the pip will not be there extension of pip will not be there but in swan neck deformity what did we discuss in swan neck deformity there will be flexion of your dip and there is hyper extension of the 
PIP. So PIP, there is hyperextension. There will be flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint in Swanick. But whereas in mallet finger deformity, the PIP will be normal, but there will be flexion of the DIP. Right? And why does this mallet finger deformity occurs? That is due to rupture of the extensor digitorum tendon. That is what is responsible for the flexion of your the distal interphalangeal joint. So that, that is about the joint deformities in rheumatoid arthritis. And what about the spine involvement in rheumatoid arthritis? Even there is also involvement of spine that is atlanto axial joint is being affected. Right? That means the part of the spine which is commonly affected in rheumatoid arthritis that is the cervical spine. And what will be the manifestation of because of the cervical spine involvement? Because of atlanto axial dislocation, the individual can develop quadriparesis. And what type of quadriparesis is that you will see in rheumatoid arthritis? It is spastic quadriparesis. Right? It is spastic quadriparesis. That is what you will see. And along with the spastic quadriparesis, these patients they can also have complications of involvement of brainstem because this particular dense of axis, the dense of this axis can protrude upwards. Once it protrudes upwards, it can cause the compression of the brainstem where there can be respiratory failure and as well as the vascular collapse as well. Respiratory failure as well as vascular collapse as well. Okay. So that is about the story related to the atlanto axial joint dislocation. Right. Next. Then followed by that, the extra articular involvement. Right. Followed by that, the extra articular involvement. In 40 percentage of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, you have the extra articular involvement that is multi system involvement will be there. And among all these particular systems, remember what is the most common extra articular manifestation is the presence of the subcutaneous nodules. Right. The presence of subcutaneous nodules. And these subcutaneous nodules, they are present on the extensor area of your forearm and they are non tender. They are non tender. Now, what would be the cause for mortality in patients with rheumatoid arthritis is that is because of the cardiac involvement. So, what will be that cardiac involvement in case of rheumatoid arthritis? That is, there can be pericarditis, right? And there can be in, uh, ischemic heart disease. There can be myocarditis. There can be cardiomyopathy. Valvular abnormality can be there in the form of mitral regurgitation. And But what would be the cause of death? The cause of death is ischemic heart disease that is coronary artery disease would be the cause of death in patients with the rheumatoid arthritis and what would be the cause for this coronary artery disease see your rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory condition so you will have a premature atherosclerosis that would be responsible for the development of coronary artery disease then how do you treat these patients okay before going into the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis you need to remember the two important syndromes of rheumatoid arthritis that is you see this question a 45 year old coal mine worker Presence with cutaneous nodules, joint pain and occasional cough with dyspnea. Chest radiograph shows multiple small bilateral lung fields, nodules are there. Right? Some of the nodules, they show cavitation and specks of calcification as well. Most likely, these features are diagnostic of the options are Jogren's, Kaplan's, silicosis and the Wegener's granulomatosis. So, what do you think is the correct answer here? Okay. Yeah, Varun Kashyap. See, uh, like how do you differentiate? rheumatoid arthritis from osteoarthritis. In case of rheumatoid arthritis, remember you do not have inflammatory pathology within the distal interphalangeal joint. Distal interphalangeal joint is not affected in case of rheumatoid arthritis. But whereas in case of osteoarthritis, there is involvement of the distal interphalangeal joint. Right? And one more point is your rheumatoid arthritis, it is an inflammatory arthritis. Whereas osteoarthritis, it is non-inflammatory arthritis. So, how can you definitely diagnose is by synovial fluid examination. Synovial fluid examination in case of rheumatoid arthritis, you can have almost 5000 to 50,000 cells per cubic millimeter in the synovial fluid analysis. What are those cells? That is the WBCs, inflammatory cells. But whereas here in osteoarthritis, your WBCs are not elevated in the synovial fluid. So, this is how you can differentiate rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. Okay. Yes, Varun, is that clear for you? Okay. Now, after having discussed about the differences, now let me tell you about this syndrome. What exactly is this syndrome? This syndrome is your Kaplan syndrome. What is this Kaplan syndrome? Where you have the rheumatoid arthritis, along with rheumatoid arthritis, the development of coal workers' pneumoconiosis. 
that is what is called as the Kaplan syndrome. Now, in case of the cold workers pneumoconiosis, what is that you will see within the chest X-ray? In the chest X-ray, you will observe that there is multiple small nodules in bilateral lung fields, right? Multiple small nodules in the bilateral lung fields. That is what you will observe, okay? That is what is your Kaplan syndrome. One more syndrome you need to be very much aware that is called Felty syndrome. Now, you see this question. True regarding felty syndrome is all except which is that which is not included in your felty syndrome splenomegaly rheumatoid arthritis neutropenia and as well as the nephropathy so which is not included in your felty syndrome that will be your nephropathy so this is a triad that will be there in felty syndrome that is a part of your rheumatoid arthritis then in rheumatoid arthritis you should be very much aware of the investigation of choice the investigation of choice in rheumatoid arthritis it is not ra factor it is your anti ccp RA factor it is non-specific, right? RA factor is present in multiple other conditions also, right? So that is the reason why the investigation of choice may be the anti-CCP. And you take this RA factor. This is also an antibody. And what type of antibody is your the RA factor? It is an IgM antibody which is directed against FC portion of the IgG, right? Which is directed against FC portion of the IgG. Right? And the other investigations are the synovial fluid examination. Synovial fluid examination in rheumatoid arthritis will show you that there is 5000 to 50,000 cells per cubic millimeter. Why? Because it's an inflammatory condition. And next important is the x-ray. Whenever you do an x-ray of the digits, you will notice that there is periarticular erosions or there will be periarticular osteopenia. See, surrounding the joint, you can see that it is blackish in color that tells you that there is periarticular osteopenia and not only that there will be also decrease in the joint space right there will be also decrease in the joint space so there will be joint space loss okay right and next important investigation is the mri the mri will show you the presence of synovitis or joint infusion joint effusion or marrow edema so this is about the treatment in sorry the investigations in case of the rheumatoid arthritis and what is the drug of choice in case of rheumatoid arthritis the drug of choice in case of rheumatoid arthritis that will be your methotrexate and this methotrexate the dosage is around 5 to 20 milligrams that you have to give once weekly right 5 to 20 milligrams once a week the remaining all days the remaining six days you need to give folinic acid so, like the treatment in case of rheumatoid arthritis in acute phase, right? In acute phase, we give either NSAIDs or steroids, right? NSAIDs or steroids in acute phase. But what is the group of drugs which are given as the disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs? So, we have two groups of drugs that is non biologicals and as well as the biological demas. Actually, we need to start with only methotrexate. And if the patient is not responding to methotrexate, then you can step up the dose up to maximum 20 milligrams per week. Or you can give a triple therapy. What is a triple therapy? The triple therapy include methotrexate, then sulfasalazine, then hydroxychloroquine. And even with this triple therapy, if the patient's symptoms are not responding, then you need to start the biological DMARDs. And these biological DMARDs include the TNF-alpha inhibitors, the uh, Ankyra, then abatacept, and as well as the rituximab. Okay. So this is about the story related to the rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, and only one one thing you need to be very much aware is methotrexate should be given once daily. The remaining six days you should give folinic acid. And this that the, you know this prescription should be explained to the patient very clearly. If suppose like I had a, I had a patient, right? What that patient has interpreted is six days she was taking methotrexate, one day she was taking folinic acid, right? So exactly ulta interpretation. And she presented with very severe pancytopenia and repeated infection, right? Because your methotrexate can cause bone marrow suppression causing pancytopenia, right? So that is what the presentation of the patient was. So that was about the rheumatoid arthritis. Now, after having discussed about rheumatoid arthritis, let me just do a quick recap of the Bayset syndrome. So all of the following are the features of the Bayset syndrome except recurrent after stomatitis, multi-system involvement seen only in tropics, common in the youngsters. Any one of you? Right. So, let me tell you, Bayset's, what is another name for Bayset's? It is also called Oroculogenital Syndrome. And remember, Bayset's is not just seen only in tropics. It is seen both in tropical and as well as the subtropical countries as well. Right. Tropical and as well as subtropical countries as well. And the hallmark manifestation is the 
recurrent after stomatitis multi system involvement will be there and it is very common in youngsters of age group around 20 to 30 years right of age group around 20 to 30 years and what is the another name we have discussed the another name is the oro oculo genital syndrome and the hla is the hla b51 or the hla b5 right hla b51 or hla b5 and this um, Bayesat syndrome is very common in which country, right? It is very common in Turkey. It is very, very common, most prevalent in Turkey, right? Now, what will be the manifestations we have discussed? That is recurrent aphthous ulcers. That is the hallmark. And these ulcers, you know, they are very painful, right? They are very, very painful. And when I am using the word recurrent, how many times they appear uh, in a year? They appear almost three times in one year. And whenever they disappear, Right, whenever they disappear, there is no scar formation. And your after ulceration, they are the earliest manifestation of the basis. Right, earliest manifestation of the basis. Okay, and this uh, after ulceration, we consider it as sign phone on for the diagnosis. That means if your recurrent after ulcers is not there, then it is not basis at all. And whenever these lesions appear, you will get or you will have two to five lesions. Right, you will have two to five lesions per attack. Okay, and the next important is the genital ulcer. Definitely, one important is after ulceration. Next important is the genital ulceration. And even this genital ulcerations also, they are the recurrent genital ulceration. But here there will be scar formation whenever the ulcer heals. Right, and next is the ocular lesions. What are the ocular lesions in biceps? You have the development of anterior and as well as the posterior uveitis, right? Anterior uveitis and as well as the posterior uveitis. And because of this anterior uveitis or posterior uveitis, the individual can develop blindness. See, because of the anterior uveitis, what is the presentation? Anterior uveitis is associated with a triad. What is a triad? Photophobia, blurred vision and red eye, right? Photophobia, blurred vision and red eye. Whereas posterior uveitis, right? In posterior uveitis, there may be the visual problems where subsequently the individual may go into blindness as well. Okay, so that will be the ocular lesions. Then skin manifestations. See, skin manifestations are in the form of erythema nodosum and as well as the acne form eruptions, right? Erythema nodosum and acne form eruptions. Then what will be the CNS involvement in biocytes? The CNS involvement in case of biocytes that includes the development of meningitis, and here it is the sterile meningitis. And how will be the meningitis? Recurrent meningeal headaches will be there. Recurrent meningeal headaches. So, sterile meningitis and there can be even cranial nerve palsy and there can be also development of seizures. And GIT involvement will be in the form of after ulceration. Where exactly will be the after ulceration? That will be in the ileum and as well as the cecum. Then, vascular involvement. What will be the vascular involvement is? There will be involvement of pulmonary artery causing pulmonary artery aneurysm. And if this pulmonary artery aneurysm rupture, there can be development of the pulmonary hemorrhage in these individuals. And there is also involvement of the joints in biceps and the joints which are being affected in biceps, they are, that is, the peripheral arthritis. And the joints which are being affected is, either it is monoarticular or polyarticular, right? Either single joint or multiple joints are being affected. And this particular joint involvement, it is non-deforming. Right? So, there is no deformities in this case. And lastly, pulmonary involvement that will be in the form of pulmonary artery vasculitis. That is what we were discussing. And because of pulmonary artery vasculitis, the patient can present with the chest pain. And not only chest pain, the patient can also have dyspnea. Right? The patient can also have dyspnea. So, these are this is the multi-system involvement in biceps. But what is the most common manifestation? That is recurrent after stomatitis. Okay? Then, how do you diagnose this biceps? That is by your pathology test. So, the pathology test will be positive. So, what exactly is your pathology test? It is phenomenon of developing aseptic nodule or ulcer which is larger than 2 mm in diameter 24 to 48 hours following a sterile needle prick. That is called pathology test where your uh, pathology test will be positive. Then, how do you treat these patients with the basics? See, now, first and first is the colchicine. Right, so this colchicin and as well as right the colchicin and as well as the topical corticosteroids, 
they will reduce the mucocutaneous finding. That means, right, they will reduce the mucocutaneous finding. That means, they will reduce this recurrent after stomatitis. And one more drug that is Eprimilast, right. What exactly is your Eprimilast? It is a selective phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, right, selective phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. It is an FDA approved drug for the treatment of oral ulcer in basics, okay. And when there is severe disease manifestation, that means along with the oral stomatitis, recurrent after ulcers, if there is like multi-system involvement, then we give steroids, right, then we give steroids. Then coming to your azathioprine, when will you give azathioprine is, azathioprine it is effective steroid sparing agent. So for suppose if the individual is developing the features of Cushing's, then we need to stop the steroids, then we need to give azathioprine. And the other drugs are the infliximab, cyclosporin and then cyclophosphamide. These three drugs are indicated for severe ocular and central nervous system manifestations. So whenever there is ocular and the central nervous system, what is the ocular manifestation we have discussed? Anterior and posterior uveitis. What is the central nervous system manifestation we have discussed? That is the sterile meningitis, cranial nerve palsy and even seizures. And vascular involvement we have discussed. That vascular involvement will be in the form of the thrombophlebitis. So, whenever there is thrombophlebitis, you can give this aspirin. So, this aspirin that is mainly for thrombophlebitis. Now, what are the conditions where we give the oral colchicin? The oral colchicin is given for arthritis. What did I tell you? These patients, they will have peripheral arthritis. So, even for arthritis, we can give this colchicin, right? Whereas, the topical, you can give for the mucocutaneous manifestation. So, this is about your biocytes in detail that is HLA B51 or HLA B5, right? Next, then followed by that, let me take up the discussion of the retards or reactive arthritis. All are true regarding retard syndrome except interstitial lung disease, conjunctivitis, occurs after sexual exposure, ulcers on the palm, and so. Remember, in patients with retards or reactive arthritis, you don't have the lung involvement. You don't have the lung involvement and it is characterized by a triad. What is a triad in retards or reactive arthritis? One is asymmetrical arthritis, then urethritis or cervicitis and then conjunctivitis. Now, you take this uh, arthritis. See, this arthritis, the joints which are commonly affected is, that is mainly the joints of the lower limb. Mainly the joints of the lower limb that is being affected. Along with the arthritis, these patients, they also develop enthesitis. What do you understand by the word enthesitis? It is the inflammation of the tendon at the point of insertion over the bone. Right? Inflammation of the tendon at the point of insertion over the bone. That is what is called as the enthesitis. Right? And this conjunctivitis. Right? That is uh, ocular manifestation. Either conjunctivitis can be there or there can be development of the anterior uveitis as well. And the urogenital manifestation can be in the form of urethritis or cervicitis. And in females, there can be even fallopian tube inflammation that is in the form of salpingitis. Or in males, even there can be uh, inflammation of the prostate that is prostatitis. So, this will be the urogenital manifestation. And you need to know a few more skin manifestations that is mucocutaneous manifestation. So, number one, there will be oral ulcers. Along with the oral ulcers, these patients, they developed hyperkeratotic lesions. Where will be this hyperkeratotic lesions? That is over the palm and as well as the sole. And that hyperkeratotic lesions that is called as keratoderma, right? That is called as keratoderma blenorrhagica, right? That is what is your hyperkeratotic lesions, right? Next. And over the glands, there can be also sarcinate belenitis in males, right? There can be uh, uh, inflammation of the glands. And the rare manifestation can be cardiac involvement and that cardiac involvement will be in the form of the cardiac conduction defects, right? Cardiac conduction defects or there can be development of the aortic regurgitation, right? So, this is about your reactive arthritis. But you have to remember that this Wieter syndrome or reactive arthritis where you have HLA B27, what is the etiology? They usually occur following the sexually transmitted infection or the gastrointestinal infection. What is the gastrointestinal infection? That will be Shigella, Salmonella and Campylobacter. The genitourinary infection will be the Chlamydia trochomatis. But if the question is asked which is most common in between these two, most common in between these two will be your Chlamydia trochomatis that is sexually transmitted form. That is what is responsible for your retards or reactive arthritis. Then how do you diagnose this retards or reactive arthritis? 
the diagnosis it is mainly by the culture right diagnosis is mainly by the culture so this particular culture you have to take it from urethra or cervix or even from the throat okay and even the cultures of the urine and stool samples right the cultures of the urine and the stool samples they are also helpful for picking out the organism which is responsible and next is arthros uh, uh, arthrocentesis why is that you are doing arthrocentesis because these individuals they are having the involvement of the lower limb joints right there is arthritis so within the lower limb joint synovial fluid analysis you can have the presence of the inflammatory substances that means the wbcs can be around 5 5000 to 50000 cells per cubic millimeter and what is the genetic marker that will be the hla b27 then how do you treat these patients see if there is like urethritis that is genito urinary lesions are there you need to give tetracyclines right you need to give tetracyclines because the most or common organism we are anticipating is chlamydia trachomatis for which we give tetracyclines and there is also arthritis for which we need to give the nsaids and those patients who are refractory to nsaids in them you need to give the immunosuppressant drugs that is steroids or the sulfasalazine can be given and whenever there is like iritis or conjunctivitis then you need to give topical steroids right local steroids means the topical steroids whenever there is iritis or the conjunctivitis so this is about your reters or the reactive arthritis so once we are done with the reters or reactive arthritis then next important topic for the discussion is the jogren syndrome so jogren syndrome is associated with all of the following conditions except midline granuloma chronic active hepatitis rheumatoid arthritis then steroderma right so now let me take up the discussion of the jogrens so if you take this jogren syndrome the another name for this is it is also called keratoconjunctivitis sicca right it is also called keratoconjunctivitis sicca where the individual will have dry eyes and as well as dry mouth and in these patients with sicca syndrome it is not only glandular involvement there is also extra glandular involvement okay so there can be chronic active hepatitis there can be also rheumatoid arthritis there can be also scleroderma but this midline granuloma is not seen in case of the sicca syndrome right now let me take up the detailed discussion of the jogrens so what will be the glandular involvement the involvement of the lacrimal gland and involvement of the salivary gland okay so involvement of the lacrimal gland i'm sorry involvement of the lacrimal gland so the tear secretion will be reduced so there will be dry eyes and the individual will have itching and burning sensation within the eyes and the decreased salivary secretion so there will be dry mouth the individual will have difficulty in swallowing now very important is what is that particular viral infection which is associated with the development of your uh, jogren syndrome the viral infection is the hcv infection okay what about your hbv just now we have discussed hepatitis b virus it, it is associated with which form of vasculitis yes associated with which form of vasculitis okay you answer this now now if the question is asked like the extra glandular involvement what is the most common extra glandular involvement the most common extra glandular involvement will be the arthritis right very good monica and himanshu it is your polyarthritis nodosa where you have the association of hepatitis b virus okay so the most common extra glandular involvement will be arthritis along with arthritis the other manifestations that they can have is development of raynaud's phenomenon development of renal tubular acidosis development of vasculitis and there can be also lymphoma now you take primary jogrens primary jogrens means you have only jogren syndrome that means dry eyes dry mouth and extra glandular manifestation secondary jogren means along with jogren it is associated with other connective tissue disorders right it is associated with other connective tissue disorders that is called secondary jogren now what are the other associated connective tissue disorders just now we were discussing right that is rheumatoid arthritis okay the other associated connective tissue disorders will be rheumatoid arthritis or there can be association of systemic lupus erythematosus or there can be association of scleroderma or there can be association of the mixed connective tissue disease or there can be association of the chronic active hepatitis so these are the other associated connective tissue disorders that we call it as secondary jogrens now you need to know a important syndrome called herford syndrome or uveoperitis remember your herford syndrome or your uveoperitis is a close differential diagnosis for jogrens syndrome and in these patients with herford syndrome or uveoperitis where do you come across this you come across this in patients with the sarcoidosis 
it is not seen in Jogren's. It is a feature in sarcoidosis. And even in Herford syndrome, why am I telling that it is a differential diagnosis for Jogren's? Because even in your Herford syndrome, there is parotid and lacrimal gland enlargement. Right? But the hallmark feature of sarcoidosis will be bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy and there will be also 7th cranial nerve palsy in case of your sarcoidosis. Okay? Right. But please remember the differential diagnosis of your sarcoidosis or your Jogren's will be your Herford syndrome. Right? Why? Because even in this also there is enlargement of your lacrimal and salivary glands. But how will you differentiate this? How will you differentiate is you take in sarcoidosis. When you do a biopsy, you have the presence of non-caseating granuloma. But in Jogren syndrome, like what is the investigation of choice? That will be the biopsy. When you do the biopsy, you will have the presence of CD4, CD4 plus T lymphocytes that will be there in the biopsy of the Jogren syndrome. But whereas biopsy of sarcoidosis, you will have non-caseating granuloma. Now, what are the antibodies in Jogren's? The antibodies in Jogren's that will be anti rho and as well as the anti la. These are the antibodies in Jogren's, right? Now, what will happen to the salivary secretion in Jogren's? The salivary secretion in Jogren's will be reduced. But you need to be very much aware of what is a normal salivary secretion. Normal salivary secretion, it is around 1 to 2 ml per minute, right? 1 to 2 ml per minute, okay? But in Jogren's, what will happen in Jogren's? The unstimulated whole salivary secretion will be less than 1.5 ml per 15 minutes. In 15 minutes, the amount of saliva that is being secreted in Jogren's will be less than 1.5 ml. So, that is a very, very important point that you need to remember. And next thing is the Schimmer's test. Why is that we do this Schimmer's test? That is mainly to assess the lacrimal secretion, right? That is mainly to assess the lacrimal secretion. Now, this shimmer test is being done by placing a strip and if how much will be the normal tear production? The normal tear production will be up to 20 mm. That will be up to 20 mm for 5 minutes. Right? You keep that strip for 5 minutes. The test, the strip will get blotted up to 20 mm. But when will you call it as insufficient or Jogren's? That will be when the secretions are less than 5 mm. Right? On the strip, if the secretion is less than 5 mm in 5 minutes, then we consider it to be suggestive of the jaw glands. Okay? Right. Then, how do you treat these patients with the jaw glands? See, the basic point is the abnormality in the tear secretion. There is decrease in tear secretion. So, thereby there is dry eyes. So, these patients, you have to give artificial tears. Right, you have to give the artificial tears. Okay, right. And next thing is cyclosporin. See, what is the purpose of giving the cyclosporin? Is cyclosporin it will suppress the inflammation. Hmm? Cyclosporin it's it will suppress the inflammation within the lacrimal gland and thereby it can increase the tear secretion. Right. Next, these individuals, what did I tell you? Most common extra glandular manifestation will be arthritis. So for arthritis, what is that we give is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, right? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. But for individuals with severe complications, like multiple extra glandular manifestations are there. When there is multiple extra glandular involvement, that is the point when you need to give the immunosuppressive drugs, right? And these particular immunosuppressive drugs that includes the corticosteroids, Right, that is systemic corticosteroids or sometimes even intravenous immunoglobulins are also given. Right, so this is about in total of the Jogren syndrome. In total of the Jogren syndrome. Now, once we are done with the Jogren's, the next important topic in the connective tissue disorder will be the scleroderma. Right, the next important topic will be the scleroderma. So, this scleroderma, if you see, we have two forms one is localized scleroderma, and the other one is diffuse scleroderma. So, in localized scleroderma, what is the important point that you have to remember is there will be limited skin involvement and the skin involvement will be there mostly confined to the fingers, then forearm, then face and even that skin involvement also will be a very slow progression, right, very low, slow progression and the visceral, visceral organ involvement in uh, localized scleroderma, it will be very late, right, it will be very late. And some patients with limited scleroderma, they develop what is called the crest syndrome. What is this C stands for? That is calcinosis. Right? Crest in, uh, C stands for calcinosis. 
where there is subcutaneous calcification of the fingers and subcutaneous calcification along the extensor surface of the forearm. And R stands for the Raynaud's phenomenon. Right? E stands for the esophageal dysmotility. Right? E stands for the esophageal dysmotility. Right? And next S stands for sclerodactyly. Right? Sclerodactyly. Where the skin thickening is limited to the fingers. There is thickening of the skin within the fingers. And T stands for telangiectasia. What is telangiectasia? That is nothing but your dilated capillaries. That is what is your telangiectasia, right? And you need to be very much aware of there are certain drugs which can cause this scleroderma. And what are these particular drugs which can cause the scleroderma? These drugs include like bleomycin and all can cause this scleroderma. Then what about this diffuse scleroderma? See, diffuse scleroderma is that where the skin involvement is rapid. Widespread skin involvement will be there, right? Along with the widespread skin involvement, these individuals, they will have rapid progression of the visceral organ involvement, right? Rapid progression of the visceral organ involvement. That is what is your diffuse scleroderma manifestation. Now, one important point is, what are all the organs which are affected in diffuse scleroderma? So, number one, definitely yes, the skin will be involved and you can see how the skin will be there. So, like the individual will not be able to open the mouth because of the tightness of the skin and that we called as the microsomia. And you can see the digits, right? So, the digital infarcts you can see uh, in these patients with the scleroderma. Now, that will be the skin involvement. So, there will be skin thickening. Skin thickening is the most recognizable manifestation of the scleroderma. And this skin involvement mainly it starts within the digits, that too distal. And then it will progress proximally. And the next important manifestation is the Raynaud's phenomenon. Right? Now, in Raynaud's phenomenon, the color changes are very, very important. Right? The color changes are very, very important. So, initially, when the individual is exposed to the cold environment, there will be pallor. Then there will be development of cyanosis. Then there will be erythema, red color. So pale, blue and red. Then what will be the GIT manifestation? So the, 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 connect, the abnormal collagen gets accumulated even within the esophagus. So once there is accumulation of the uh, abnormal collagen within the lower esophageal sphincter, the patient will have dysphagia. So there will be difficulty in swallowing. And there will be also reflux. There will be development of gastroesophageal reflux disease. And not only that, see, the abnormal collagen gets accumulated even within the intestinal wall and as well as stomach also. So, gastrointestinal emptying will be delayed. And because the abnormal collagen is accumulated within the intestine, absorption of the uh, nutrients will not be there across the intestine. So, the nutrients will stay within the intestine and that particular nutrients will get fermented by the intestinal bacteria. So, there will be excessive gases which are being produced within the intestine and that we call it as pneumatosis, right, that we call it as pneumatosis intestinalis, hmm? pneumatosis intestinalis, then followed by that the musculoskeletal system involvement. So, musculoskeletal system involvement will be in the form of symmetrical arthritis. Right, that will be in the form of the symmetrical arthritis. That will be the musculoskeletal system involvement. And what will be the kidney involvement? The, the kidney involvement or the renal uh, involvement will be in the form of renal artery stenosis due to abnormal collagen accumulation within the renal artery. And there will be activation of RAS resulting in the hypertensive crisis. And lung involvement will be in the form of the interstitial fibrosis that is due to accumulation of the collagen. And what will be the cardiac involvement? The cardiac involvement will be in the form of the pericardial effusion and as well as the myocardial fibrosis. Right? Myocardial fibrosis. Now, what do you think is the cause of death in these patients? See, the cause of... See, and one more. Yeah. Cardiac involvement, the other thing that you should remember is the development of cardiomyopathy. That is development of restrictive cardiomyopathy. And because of the development of restrictive cardiomyopathy, these patients, they can have small sign, all other uh, features can be there. Now, the point is, what is the cause of death in these patients with the scleroderma? So, the cause of death in these patients with scleroderma, very, very important, that is development of the pulmonary artery hypertension. And because of the pulmonary artery hypertension, there can be right heart failure, there can be development of the corpulmonary, and finally, death of the individual. So, the cause of death in these individuals would be 
the development of the pulmonary hypertension. Now, what do you think is the drug of choice in patients with the scleroderma? The drug of choice in patients with scleroderma, again scleroderma, it is what? It is an autoimmune condition. See, in case of localized scleroderma, the antibody is the anti-centromere antibody. And in case of diffuse scleroderma, the antibody is the anti-topoisomerase antibody. Right? Now, we don't want this antibody production. So, what do you think is the drug of choice? The drug of choice will be the steroids. That is prednisolone. And these patients, because of your low, lower esophageal sphincter stenosis, they are developing gastroesophageal reflux. So, for which you can give the proton pump inhibitors. And there is delayed gastric emptying because of the accumulation of the collagen within the stomach. So, you need to give a prokinetic agent. And that prokinetic agent, that is your metaclo uh, metaclopromide, which can increase the gastric emptying or the cisapride or mozapride. So, that will be the drugs for increasing the gastric emptying. Next is the hypertensive crisis. Now, how do you uh, handle this hypertensive crisis due to renal artery stenosis? In this particular scenario, whenever there is hypertensive crisis, that we call it as scleroderma renal crisis. And in scleroderma renal crisis, the drug that we give is the ACE inhibitors. Right, the drug that we give is the ACE inhibitors. Okay, right, and the other alternative drugs will be your calcium channel blocker, that is nicardipine, and all can be given. Right, previously we were giving nitroprusside, but these days your sodium nitroprusside is not being used because of the cyanide toxicity and all. Okay, so this is about the manifestations in scleroderma. And one more important point in scleroderma that you need to be very much aware is what is the cause of death? Pulmonary hypertension. So, what are the drugs that you need to give for treating this pulmonary hypertension? You need to give endothelin receptor antagonist that is bosenta and the alternative drugs are the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors that is sildenafil tadalafil or vardenafil or your cgp that is guanylate cyclase stimulant that is rosigot and endothelin 1 receptor antagonist that is bosenton or uh, macitenton these are the drugs which will definitely be given as a first line for the pulmonary hypertension in case of the scleroderma but only concern is whenever there is refractory pulmonary hypertension. See, whenever there is refractory pulmonary hypertension, in them you need to give the prostacycline analogs. And these prostacycline analogs, they are epoprostenol, triprostenol and as well as the iloprost. So, these are the drugs which are given for treatment of pulmonary hypertension. So, which type of patients with scleroderma, they can have this mortality that is only diffuse scleroderma not the localized scleroderma. Why? Because in diffuse scleroderma, you have rapid visceral organ involvement, even there can be development of pulmonary hypertension that can cause the death of the individual. And this is what is your treatment. So, the first line drugs that can, you can give is endothelin receptor antagonists. The alternative drugs are phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors that is sildenafil, tadalafil and as well as vardenafil. The new drugs are vanillate cyclase stimulant that is riosigot, right? And we have the refractory condition, we give prostacycline analogs that will be epoprostenol, triprostenol and as well as the iloprost. So, we are done with the scleroderma. And one last topic for the discussion will be, yes. Okay. You are seeing Mr. Hensley, a 72 year old man with only history of hypertension on hydrochlorothiazide. He presents today with acute excruciating knee pain. On examination, his knee is warm, mildly erythematous, swollen and tender to touch or passive movement. Microscopic examination of the joint fluid is shown in the figure. What is Mr. Hinsley most likely metabolic derangement? Acute bacterial joint infection, antibodies to anti-nuclear antigen, hyaline cartilage degeneration, increased production of inorganic pyrophosphate, uric acid overproduction. Right. So, which particular joint is affected? That is knee joint. Okay. And what are all the problems? He is a 72 year male. He is taking thiazide diuretic and this is the synovial fluid analysis. Right, this is the synovial fluid analysis. Right, so the correct answer here is the uric acid overproduction. So, what exactly is this suggestive of? This is suggestive of your gout or the gouty arthritis. Why is that you are considering gout or gouty arthritis even though the knee joint is involved? Actually, in gout, what is the joint which is being affected? That is the involvement of the first metatarsophalangeal joint. The next most common joint which can be affected is the knee joint. Right? The knee joint. And what are the risk factors in this patient to consider it as gout or gout, gouty arthritis? First important risk factor is he is a male. That is one thing. 
Second important risk factor is the patient is having hypertension. And third important risk factor is the patient is taking thiazides. These thiazides, they increase the uric acid production. And why? How is that you are telling it is a gout? The synovial fluid analysis, right? The synovial fluid analysis, you are seeing the negatively birefringent needle shaped crystals, right? Negatively birefringent needle shaped crystals, right? So, which is suggestive of your gout or the gouty arthritis. And please remember, in your gout or gouty arthritis, the serum uric acid, right, the serum uric acid, it may be normal also, right, it may be normal also. When can you have the serum uric acid being normal? That is, in acute forms of gouty arthritis, the urate which is present within the serum, it will go and accumulate within the joint in the form of urate crystals. That is monosodium urate crystals within the joint. So, when the entire urate has gone into the joint, the uric acid levels within the serum or plasma may be normal. So, that is the reason why serum uric acid itself we don't take as the diagnostic test. The investigation of choice will be synovial fluid analysis which will show you negatively by monosodium urate crystals. Understood? And the serum uric acid levels, they are mainly used as the monitoring. The treatment right monitoring the treatment okay right now let me take up the discussion of like how do you treat these patients so you see here you're planning to start allopurinol for miss maggie for a new diagnosis of gouty arthritis which of the following best describes appropriate dosing strategies for the allopurinol you go through all the options allopurinol and azotheoprine are commonly used together in treatment of gout allopurinol dosing should be adjusted for liver function Third option, allopurinol dosing should be titrated to achieve the serum uric acid levels of less than 6. Fourth option, allopurinol should be avoided when patients are taking colchicin. Allopurinol toxicity is more common in patients expressing the HLA B27. So, what do you think is the correct statement here? Okay, so what exactly are the treatment for your gout or gouty arthritis? You need to give uricosuric agents that will increase, right, that will increase the uric acid excretion. And then you need to decrease the uric acid synthesis. Yes, any one of you? Uh, no, it is not D here. Right. So, what are the uricosuric agents? The uricosuric agents that includes rasburicase and as well as the probenicid. And what are the drugs which will decrease the uric acid synthesis? They are basically xanthine oxidase inhibitors. And these xanthine oxidase inhibitors are allopurinol is one particular drug and the other one is febuxostat. These two are your xanthine oxidase inhibitors. All right. Now, Coming to this particular dosing. So, the allopurinol, if you see, it can be given as a single morning dose. That is 100 milligrams is the initial dose that we start with. 100 milligrams initially we start with. And how much of allopurinol you can increase up to? You can increase up to 800 milligrams. And remember, not in patients with liver function, you require the dosing adjustment. You require the dosing adjustment in patients with the chronic renal failure. In patients with chronic renal failure, they require the dosing adjustment. It is not the liver disease patients, right? And whenever you are giving allopurinol, what should be your target value of your urate? The target value of your urate should be less than 6 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. Now, if you take the toxicity, toxicity of allopurinol has been recognized increasingly in patients who use thiazide diuretics, right? Not so, allopurinol should be avoided when patients are taking allopurinol. No problem. Colchicin can be given in acute form. In acute gouty arthritis, we give colchicin. Right? We give colchicin. And along with this colchicin, you can add allopurinol. But only thing is, along with the allopurinol, you cannot add thiazide diuretics. You cannot add penicillins. You, can add, you cannot add the ampicillin. Okay? And allopurinol toxicity is more common in patients expressing HLA B27 is a wrong statement. Right? Now, in which group of individuals where the allopurinol toxicity can be there is, that is in patients who have the HLA B5801. These patients, if they take allopurinol, there is increased risk of the allopurinol toxicity, right? And this colchicin is commonly used along with the allopurinol in the treatment of your gout or gouty arthritis. And even your allopurinol and as well as azathioprine, are commonly used together in the treatment of gout. Let me tell you, allopurinol and azathioprine should not be co-prescribed. 
Why? Because azathioprine can increase the blood levels of allopurinol leading to toxicity. That is the reason why both of these drugs should not be used together. Okay. So this is about the story related to your gout or gouty arthritis. So with this, yeah, Himanshu, I'll teach you the pseudo gout as well. So if you take this pseudo gout, in pseudo gout, the joint which is commonly affected is the knee joint, right? And the crystals which are being uh, accumulated in pseudo gout will be calcium pyrophosphate crystals, that is CPPD crystals. And these crystals, they are positively birefringent, right? These crystals, they are positively birefringent, and the drug of choice will be the anesides. That is what is your pseudo gout. Okay, so this completes the discussion of your the entire connective tissue disorders. Okay, so what all topics we have completely revised? So we are done and dusted with the all these topics, right? That is vasculitis, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, biceps, reactive arthritis, sarcoidosis, gout, scleroderma, apla, and Jogren's. Right? We are done with all the connective tissue disorders, right? So, this particular PDF with annotations, I will send it to you on my telegram channel that is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Guba. So, you can download it from there. And I will also be sending this PDF to Dr. Bhanu Prakash telegram channel as well. Okay. So, we will just take a break for 10 or 15 minutes. Then, we will come back and discuss the pulmonology. Not only pulmonology, right? We need to discuss the cardiology remaining topics. So, I will discuss the cardiology remaining topics first. Then, I will go on to the pulmonology. So, we will just take a break for 10 minutes. Break.
all right so welcome back so now in this particular session uh, in the remaining uh, session of another one and a half to two hours like uh, i'll uh, finish the cardiology remaining topics which we are uh, supposed to complete day before yesterday itself and then the pulmonology now what are the remaining topics in the cardiology that i'll be discussing now is the pericardial effusion then cardiac tamponade then coronary artery disease and as well as the rheumatic fever so these topics let me try to finish first now the first important thing is the pericardial effusion and as well as cardiac tamponade first of all what is the normal quantity of the pericardial fluid the normal quantity of the pericardial fluid it is around 20 to 30 ml that is present within the pericardial space now when do you call it as pericardial effusion you call it as pericardial effusion when more than 50 ml of the fluid is accumulated in the pericardial space we call it as pericardial effusion now what is the difference between the pericardial effusion and as well as the cardiac tamponade the difference between these two is that when if the fluid which is accumulating within the pericardial space if it is like gradual so if it is gradual accumulation of the fluid in the pericardial space then we call it as pericardial effusion but if the fluid which is accumulating within the pericardial space if it is like abrupt accumulation of the fluid in the pericardial space that will be the cardiac tamponade now please remember it is rapidity with which the fluid is accumulating right it is the rapidity with which the fluid is accumulating will decide whether it is pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade it is not the quantity which will decide the pericardial effusion or the cardiac tamponade see even there can be accumulation of 200 ml of fluid also if it is abrupt it can it is called as cardiac tamponade even there can be 2000 ml of fluid which can be accumulated but if it is gradual we call it as pericardial effusion only right now if you take this pericardial effusion so what will be the presentation in these individuals the presentation will be in the form of the dyspnea why because they will have the diastolic dysfunction because of the accumulation of the fluid in the pericardial space then how do you diagnose this pericardial effusion is number one is it can be diagnosed by the 2d echo that is one methodology of diagnosis your pet of your pericardial effusion and the other method of diagnosis is by your chest x-ray and then the ecg now what will the chest x-ray show you the so chest x-ray will show you that there is a cardiomegaly and if you take the pedicle of the heart right so you will have a narrow pedicle right you will have the narrow pedicle so that is what you will observe or that is what you will notice in case of the pericardial effusion and this classical appearance of the heart this is what is called as the water bag appearance or money bag appearance and next thing is the ecg what will the ecg show in case of pericardial effusion is that is the presence of low voltage complexes now what do you understand by this word low voltage complexes that is if the amplitude of the qrs complexes if it is less than 10 mm in the chest leads and if the amplitude if it is less than 5 mm in the limb leads this we call it as the pericardial uh, sorry this we call it as low voltage complexes now what are all the conditions where you can have low voltage complexes one is pericardial effusion then you can also see this in patients with a constrictive pericarditis and even in restrictive cardiomyopathy these are all the differential diagnosis and other conditions like morbid obesity uh, copd patients like emphysema and massive left sided pleural effusion in all these conditions you can have low voltage complexes then how do you treat these patients is you need to do pericardiosynthesis in order to look for what is the cause of the pericardial effusion so you need to treat the cause of the pericardial effusion right so that is what is the treatment for your pericardial effusion but when will you do pericardiosynthesis if there is you know massive pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade that is the point when we do therapeutic pericardiosynthesis i'll discuss that in the cardiac tamponade itself okay right now and one more important ecg finding is for suppose if there is massive pericardial effusion then you get what is called as the electrical alternance okay you get what is called as the electrical alternance what do you understand by this word the electrical alternance see electrical alternance is that if you see this ecg in this you don't have the electrical alternance this is actually low voltage complex okay what is that electrical alternance is that one complex will be tall and the other complex will be small one complex will be tall and the other complex will be small and this electrical alternance is not just seen only in massive pericardial effusion you also come across this in cardiac tamponade 
cardiac tamponade definitely the ecg finding is the electrical alternance itself why is that because the heart will be swinging in the fluid when the heart swings anteriorly you get large complex and when the heart swings posteriorly you get the small complex that is what is your electrical alternance see this electrical alternance you should not get confused with the pulses alternance pulses alternance is that where you have a, a, a larger amplitude pulse then followed by lower amplitude larger amplitude pulse and then lower amplitude where do you get this pulses alternance you will get that in case of severe left ventricular failure okay right then followed by that the next important topic for the discussion is the cardiac tamponade so i have said you already so the important difference is the accumulation of the fluid rapidity so if there is abrupt accumulation of the fluid in the pericardial space that we call it as the cardiac tamponade now for this you need to understand how much is the normal intrapericardial pressure and how much will be the intrapericardial pressure that will be elevated in cardiac tamponade see the normal intracardiac pressure that will be around minus 5 to plus 5 millimeters of mercury but in cardiac tamponade the intrapericardial pressure that will be more than or equal to 15 millimeters of mercury now when the intrapericardial pressure is greater than 15 millimeters of mercury what will happen that will restrict the venous return that will restrict the ventricular filling because your intrapericardial pressure is very high the ventricle cannot relax right there will be diastolic collapse of the ventricle there will be diastolic collapse of the ventricles okay then what will be the etiology that will be causing your cardiac tamponade this cardiac tamponade it can occur secondary to the chest trauma it can also occur secondary to the rupture of the aortic aneurysm right secondary to the penetrating trauma to the chest these can cause the cardiac tamponade and not only that cardiac tamponade can also be seen in chronic renal failure that is due to the fluid overload there can be even cardiac there can be cardiac tamponade now what will be the clinical features in these patients with the cardiac tamponade the clinical features is they will develop sudden onset dyspnea right they will develop sudden onset dyspnea now what is the cause for sudden onset dyspnea because there is diastolic collapse of the ventricle so there is complete backflow of the fluid from the left ventricle to the left atrium from the left atrium into the pulmonary veins then into the pulmonary capillaries causing pulmonary edema and that is the cause for sudden onset dyspnea now you take this characteristic triad that is called as the Beck's triad. Now what is this Beck's triad in case of the cardiac tamponade is that number one there will be raised JVP. Number two you will have muffled okay. So there will be hypotension and there will be muffled heart sounds. So this is what is the Beck's triad in case of the cardiac tamponade. Then how will be the JVP? The JVP will be elevated but one important point you have to remember is that the Kussmaul sign will be absent in patients with the cardiac tamponade. And what will be the characteristic pulse in cardiac tamponade? The characteristic pulse will be pulses paradoxes. Right? What exactly is your pulses paradoxes where there will be fall in your systolic blood pressure more than 10 millimeters of mercury during inspiration is what is called pulses paradoxes. And how will be the heart sounds? The heart sounds that will be muffled heart sounds. And what will the 2D echo will be showing in cardiac tamponade is in cardiac tamponade you will uh, notice that there is diastolic collapse of the ventricle. Right there is diastolic collapse of the ventricle and ECG just now we were discussing that there will be electrical alternance right where you have alternating large and small complexes. And what is the immediate treatment that you need to do in cardiac tamponade is you need to do pericardiosynthesis. Now whenever you are doing this pericardiosynthesis, what should be the approach? The approach should be subxiphoid approach. So through subxiphoid approach, you need to do the pericardiosynthesis when you, where you need to take out the pericardial fluid. Now this is what is the ECG of the electrical alternance where you have large and as well as the small complexes. Large and as well as small complexes. This is the ECG of the cardiac tamper. Right? So with this, we are done with the pericardial effusion and as well as the cardiac tamponade. And next important topic in the cardiology which is left out is the coronary artery disease. In the coronary artery disease, what is the most common cause of the coronary artery disease? That will be atherosclerosis. Right? You have many other risk factors. Right? But one of the very important cause for coronary artery disease will be atherosclerosis. And other risk factors like smoking, family history, diabetes, hypertension, sedentary lifestyle, excessive stress, these all can contribute to the development of the coronary artery disease. Now, if you see the spectrum of the coronary artery disease, we classify that into ischemia and as well as infarction. So, ischemia is what? Ischemia is that where there is only decreased blood supply to the myocardium. Whereas, infarction is that 
where there is death of the myocardium and in both of them please remember the manifestation will be the same that is chest pain but what is the characteristic difference is the cardiac biomarkers right the characteristic difference is the cardiac biomarkers the cardiac biomarkers in case of the ischemia it will be negative but whereas cardiac biomarkers in case of infarction they will be positive what are those cardiac biomarkers that is your troponin your ckmv all that i'll tell you now so now what will be the uh, com i mean the spectrum in the ischemia that is stable angina principal angina and unstable angina whereas in case of infarction depending upon the ecg changes we classify that into non st elevation mi and as well as st elevation mi now let me discuss about the individual parts of the spectrum so the first thing is the stable angina so stable angina the another terminology which is being given to this is it is also called reversible ischemia and what will be the duration of the chest pain in case of chronic stable angina is <clears throat> the duration will be around 10 to 15 minutes and this particular chest pain will be retrosternal and this chest pain it increases on exertion and this chest pain it reduces on taking rest or on taking sublingual nitrate so on taking sublingual nitrate or taking rest if the chest pain reduces which is of duration of less than 10 to 15 minutes that will be chronic stable angina now these patients whenever they are describing the chest pain they will clutch the fist over the, the they'll clutch the hand in the form of a fist hmm? they'll clutch the hand in the form of a fist over the precordium while describing the chest pain and that is what is called as levine sign and but in these patients with uh, those patients with diabetic autonomic neuropathy they don't have this uh, angina they can have silent mi so what will be the angina equivalent will be the dyspnea and the ecg in case of chronic stable angina you don't have any specific changes you have non specific stt changes then what will be the diagnostic uh, investigation for your chronic stable angina that is treadmill test or dobutamine stress echo should be done so when you do a treadmill test like the, while doing the treadmill if you have the development of st segment depression more than 0.1 millivolts then it is suggestive of the tmt to be positive suggestive of an underlying coronary artery disease then what is this dobutamine stress echo dobutamine stress echo is that you started the injection of the dobutamine that will increase the heart rate if there is development of new regional wall motion abnormality then we consider it as the dsc to be positive which is suggestive that there is an underlying coronary artery disease and you need to know some important contraindications for treadmill test number 1 uncontrolled cardiac arrhythmias like vtvf ongoing don't do treadmill test right and if the patient is having symptomatic aortic stenosis that is in the form of syncopal attack or angina or dyspnea don't do this treadmill test okay and what is the drug of choice in case of chronic stable angina is beta blockers why is that because beta blockers they will reduce the heart rate and thereby they will reduce the myocardial oxygen demand and in coronary artery disease the supply is less so if you reduce the myocardial oxygen de demand that can reduce the progression of the chronic stable angina they are considered as a drug of choice and what are the other drugs that we give is for pain we give nitrates then the other drugs are the antiplatelets or the statins can be given and in case of chronic angina the drug which has been used is ranolazine right the drug that has been used is ranolazine okay so this is about your chronic stable angina which is also called reversible angina or reversible ischemia now you need to know or you need to be very much aware of what is the role of imaging in coronary artery disease see if you see the role of imaging in coronary artery disease we have some imaging uh, methodologies that is thallium 201 or technetium 99 this thallium 201 or technetium 99 is useful for detecting the hibernating myocardium what is hibernating myocardium and what is stunned myocardium i will discuss that and we have a pet scan that is rubidium where we use the radionuclide substance that is rubidium 82 and the purpose of this pet scan where we are using rubidium 82 is for assessment of myocardial metabolism and also for diagnosing the stunned myocardium and electron beam ct scan it is mainly for assessment of coronary artery calcification and gadolinium enhanced mri it is a sensitive test to detect and quantify the extent of infarction not infection infarction okay so that is the purpose of the gadolinium enhanced mri so now we are done with the chronic stable angina and the next important part in the spectrum is what that is prince metal angina prince metal angina it is also called as the vasospastic angina and here the spasm will be there right the spasm will be there that will be there for more than 70 the the coronary artery they undergo vasospasm by more than 
right? That is the reason why it is called vasospastic angina. And these patients, they will have chest pain during that vasospasm episode, right? Only during that vasospasm episode, they'll have this chest pain. And the most common vessel which is affected among the three, that is right coronary artery, left circumflex and left anterior descending artery, it is the right coronary artery which will undergo the vasospasm commonly in case of the fringe metal angina, right? <clears throat> and what will be the ECG changes? It is only during the chest pain you have that ST segment elevation. Right. Once the chest pain reduces, that means your vasospasm is relieved. So the ST segment elevation will return back to normal. And what is the drug of choice to, to relieve that spasm? You need to give nitrates. And the alternative drugs are the calcium channel blocker and this new molecule that is fasciodil. Right. So this is about your fringe metal angina, which is also called as the vasospastic angina. So the three important, uh, okay. so done with stable angina, fringe metal angina. Now you take these last three components that is unstable angina, NSTEMI and STEMI. These three components, they come under what is called as the acute coronary syndrome. Now, let me take up the discussion one by one. So, you take the unstable angina. See, in unstable angina, the individual will have angina at rest. It is not like chronic stable angina. In chronic stable angina, the pain will be there only on exertion. But here, the chest pain, which is of retrosternal in origin, that will be there at rest. And it will be accelerating pain. Right, it will be accelerating pain. The pain increases as the time progresses. And the next important is these patients, like we describe, the patient will describe as the angina which is appearing for the first time. So it is the new onset angina. Right now, what exactly is your Velen syndrome? Let me tell you the Velen syndrome, it is actually an ECG manifestation. Right, it is an ECG manifestation saying that there is a critical. Right, saying that there is a critical proximal left anterior descending artery stenosis in patients with unstable angina. Then what will be that ECG changes in case of Velen syndrome? That is the T wave inversion. Right, and that particular T wave inversion will be a deep T wave inversion of more than 2 mm in the precordial leaves. That is from V1 to V3, you have deep T wave inversion. That is your type 1 valence. Whereas type 2 valence is what? Where you have biphasic T wave inversion. Now, the presence of the valence, what does it indicate? It represents the pre infarction stage coronary artery disease. That means if you don't treat this pre infarction stage, this individual from a state of pre infarction stage, there is a very high chance that the patient may progress to the development of infarction. Right? The patient may progress to the development of the infarction. Okay, so that is what is your valence syndrome, right? Next, then, so that was about your, the unstable angina. Then, NSTEMI, so non-ST elevation MI. So, three important points are there. Out of this, if two are there, we can consider it as NSTEMI. First and foremost, definitely, angina is one important thing, which can be there at rest. Then, there will be rise and fall of the cardiac biomarkers, right? And ECG will be showing the ST segment depression. So these are the three important points. Out of three, if at least two are there, we can consider it as non-ST elevation MI. And what is the point of difference between NSTEMI and STEMI? In STEMI, see, in NSTEMI, like we consider it as subendocardial infarction, right? Subendocardial infarction. But whereas if you take in STEMI, in STEMI, it is transmural myocardial infarction, right? It is the transmural myocardial infarction, okay? Right. And the treatment wise, it is different. For unstable angina and as well as NSTEMI, the treatment is same. But for STEMI, the treatment is different compared to that of NSTEMI. What is that we will discuss. And this particular STEMI, we have totally five types. <coughs> Type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Type 1, it is the spontaneous MI which is related to ischemia due to primary coronary event. What is that primary coronary event? That is the plaque rupture. So once the plaque rupture, the entire coronary artery gets 100% occluded where the individual develops MI. That is type 1 MI. So either due to plaque rupture or due to coronary artery dissection. Right? Or due to coronary artery dissection. That is your type 1 MI. Then what is your type 2 MI? So type 2 MI, it is a myocardial infarction secondary to ischemia due to increased demand. Right? Due to increased demand and decreased supply. Right? And decreased supply. So, when can you have this increased demand and decreased supply is that like in case of anemia, there is like hypoxia, 
there is decreased supply, but demand is more because of tachycardia, like arrhythmias, hypertension. So in all these conditions, like anemia, arrhythmias, and as well as hypertension, so there will be increased demand and as well as decreased supply. And your type 3 MI, this is considered as the individual having a sudden unexpected cardiac death, right, including cardiac arrest. Okay, so what is the criteria to call it as sudden unexpected cardiac death? So here the death occurs before the blood samples could be obtained or the time before the rise of the cardiac biomarkers. Right before the cardiac biomarkers have increased within the blood, the individual had death because of MI that comes under your type 3 MI. Now your type 4 MI that is related to your PCA. Again we have 4A and as well as 4B. So 4A is what that this uh, stent which has been placed, it has been blocked and that is documented by coronary angiography. That is your 4, sorry. If it is documented by, right, if it is documented by raising your troponin levels more than 5 times, that will be your 4A. But if it is being documented by coronary angiogram, that stent is blocked or the stent is blocked, that is identified on autopsy, that will be your 4B. Then what is type 5? It is MI which is related to coronary artery bypass graft where the grafts have been blocked. Again, the individual have developed MI and how can you identify this? The troponin levels will be elevated and this troponin levels which are elevated will be almost 10 times. So these are the various types of MI. And what are the features of your MI? The chest pain will be there for more than 20 to 30 minutes. And ECG will be showing you the ST segment elevation like more than 1 mm in the limb leads and more than 2 mm in the chest leads. Right? And in the reciprocal leads, you will have the ST segment depression. And ECG will be showing you regional wall motion abnormality. Coronary angiogram will show you the presence of thrombus and cardiac biomarkers are being elevated. Now regarding the ECG, you need to remember one important point. So if the question is asked, what is the earliest ECG change in MI? The earliest ECG change in MI, it is not ST segment elevation, that is broad tall T wave. Right, broad tall T wave, that will be the earliest ECG manifestation in MI. Then after this broad tall T wave, the next important manifestation will be in the form of the ST segment elevation. Then what are the other changes? The other changes will be, there will be disappearance of the R wave, then there will be T wave inversion, then there will be appearance of the pathological Q wave. Right, there will be appearance of the pathological Q wave. Right? And once the MI has been resolved, all the changes will disappear. Only this pathological Q wave will be present. And only when the pathological Q wave is being present, that tells that the individual is having the old MI. So these are the ECG changes in MI. Right? And next important thing is you need to know about the cardiac biomarkers. So what is the first cardiac biomarker that is being raised is the IME. That, that is ischemia modified albumin. And this ischemia modified albumin will rise within minutes, right? And it will reach the peak value within 6 hours. And by 12 hours, it will return back to normal, right? By 12 hours, it will return back to normal. So this is the first cardiac biomarker which is being elevated. That is ischemia modified albumin. And what are the other new biomarkers? That is heart, heart fatty acid binding globulin, right? Heart fatty acid binding globulin. And the other biomarkers which are elevated within half an hour to one hour will be even myoglobin. But that myoglobin is non-specific. And what is the marker of the reinfarction? You need to do the serial levels of the troponin. And within the serial levels of troponin, if there is increase in troponin value 20% compared to the previous value, that is a marker of reinfarction. But if the question is specifically asked, like marker of reinfarction of 72 hours, then you can answer it as the CKMB because CKMB will be uh, elevated in the body only up to 3 days and after 3 days if the patient is having uh, chest pain once again that is on 4th day morning you do a CKMB levels if the CKMB levels are elevated again I mean if the CKMB elevated if the CKMB levels are elevated still even after 72 hours that tells it is a re-MI. Then LDH pattern, it is also a flipped pattern, right? LDH1 will be more than compared to that of the LDH2. So that will be flipped pattern. That is what you will observe in case of the myocardial infarction. Now, let me discuss in detail about some of these cardiac biomarkers, mainly troponins and as well as the CKMB. Troponins or CKMB, both of them, they appear within the blood within 2 to 4 hours. 
but troponins they reach the peak value within one to two days and they return back to normal within 10 to 14 days that is up to two weeks but you need to know the differential diagnosis what are the other conditions where the troponins are elevated apart from your mi that is congestive heart failure atrial fibrillation acute pulmonary embolism myocarditis chronic renal failure and sepsis all these conditions the troponin levels may be elevated then you take this ckmb ckmb it will reach the peak value within one day and it will remain elevated for up to three days right and after three days it, it will return back to normal and what is the differential diagnosis apart from mi this ckmb can also be elevated in myocarditis pericarditis and as well as the cardiac defibrillation so these are some of the points related to cardiac biomarkers now you need to know what is the treatment see if the question is asked like what is the first line management the first line management is that you need to give the aspirin right you need to give the aspirin but for pain control right for pain control you need to check the blood pressure and then you need to give the drug so for pain control you can give either morphine or you can give the nitrates right you can give the nitrates but if the question is asked like what is the first line antiplatelet that you can give is the aspirin and the loading doses of these particular drugs are 325 milligrams is the aspirin and 300 milligrams will be your clopilet and that is your clopidogrel and 80 milligrams will be the atorvastatin okay or you can give 180 milligrams instead of the clopidogrel the other drug which has been used recently is ticagrelor 180 milligrams of ticagrelor can be given these are the loading doses and instead of 80 milligrams you can give 40 milligrams of rosvastatin as well right and what is the best method of revascularization in case of the st elevation mi that will be your PCA, that is percutaneous coronary intervention is the best method of revascularization. It can cause 100% revascularization. And what are actually various methods of revascularization, that is PCA, thrombolysis and CABG. Right? The best method and immediately that can be done is the PCA. And you need to know the point here that is door to balloon time. So door to balloon time, that will be 90 minutes. Whereas what is the door to needle time? Door to needle time will be for thrombolysis and that no, door to needle time that should be within 30 minutes and remember thrombolysis we do only in ST elevation MI. We don't do thrombolysis in case of non-ST elevation MI and as well as the unstable angina. Now among these thrombolytic agents like we have streptokinase, retiplase, alteplase and tenecteplase. Right? These are the thrombolytic agents. But among all these, the maximum revascularization can be done with your tenecteplase. Remember T for thrombolysis, T for tenecteplase. That is that that is the one which can cause maximum revascularization among these four antithrom among these four thrombolytic agents. Then the next is your CABG, coronary artery bypass graft. Coronary artery bypass graft preferably is being done when the patient has the triple vessel disease on coronary angiogram or when there is severe. Right, when there is severe proximal left main coronary artery stenosis is there, that is also the indication for the coronary artery bypass graft. Then what are the complications in myocardial infarction? The electrical complication, either there can be tachyarrhythmias or there can be development of the bradyarrhythmias. Tachyarrhythmias that includes VT or VF which are very common within 24 to 48 hours of development of MI. And bradyarrhythmias are very common in patients with inferior wall MI or right ventricular MI or posterior wall MI. Okay. Now, these bradyarrhythmias that includes your Mobitz type 2 AV block, which is the most common form of bradyarrhythmia, and this can progress to even development of the complete heart block where they require temporary pacemaker insertion once they develop complete heart block. Okay. Then, what are the mechanical complications that you will come across in the myocardial? In Sorry, it is not infarction, it is. It is not infection, it is infarction. Right. So, the mechanical complications that includes the development of the ventricular septal defect, the development of the mitral regurgitation. And this mitral regurgitation are mainly because of the papillary muscle rupture or the caudate tendon rupture. And this mitral regurgitation, it is very commonly seen in case of the anterior wall MI and as well as the inferior wall MI. So, these are the mechanical complications or structural complications that you will see in patients with myocardial infarction. Then what are the late complications? Late complications include the Dressler syndrome. Now what is this Dressler syndrome? That is post myocardial infarction pericarditis which will develop after few days to weeks after development of MI. If it will develop after few weeks to months 
after development of MI. That is what is your Dressler syndrome, which is post myocardial infarction, pericarditis. So it's a pericarditis. So the individual will present with chest pain. And even the ESR is also elevated in Dressler syndrome. And what is the treatment that we give? Either we give colchicine or we give high dose aspirin or we give corticosteroids. So that is what is the treatment in case of Dressler syndrome. And you need to know the two important myocardiums that is stunned myocardium and as well as the hibernating myocardium. So this stunned myocardium and as well as hibernating myocardium, as already I have said you, we can differentiate it by the imaging. Like you take hibernating myocardium, you can uh, detect it by thallium 201 or technetium 99 scan. Whereas you take stunned myocardium, stunned myocardium can be detected by your PET scan where the radionuclide substance that we use is rubidium 82, right, rubidium 82, okay. Now let me discuss what exactly is your stunned myocardium or the hibernating myocardium. See, both of them, they will develop after MI, right, both of them, they will develop after MI. But stunned myocardium refers to the state of the post ischemic reversible myocardial contractile dysfunction that persists despite myocardial infarction. That means stunned myocardium despite myocardial reperfusion, right, despite myocardial reperfusion, there is still contractile dysfunction. That is stunned myocardium. What is hibernating myocardium? Hibernating myocardium is that the myocardial contractility will return back to normal after reperfusion. Okay. So, the myocardial contractility, right, that will return back to normal after the myocardial reperfusion. So, that will be your hibernating myocardium. That will be your hibernating myocardium. So, you can differentiate these two by your imaging studies, right. Then after, so this is about your coronary artery disease, quick revision. And the last important topic that is being left out is the acute rheumatic fever. So this rheumatic fever, please remember one of the very, very important points. It is not an infectious condition. It is an inflammatory condition. Why is that I am I telling? Like it's an inflammatory condition or inflammatory disease. That is because the pathogenesis that you will see in rheumatic fever is that our immune system will act against the components of, it will act against M protein component of group A beta hemolytic streptococcal cell wall. The antibodies which are being formed against the M protein of group A, group A beta hemolytic streptococcal cell wall, that will be acting on the connective tissue of the individual. Right. So, that is why it is an inflammatory disorder and it is a recurrent disorder. Because it is recurrent, these patients, they will be requiring the penicillin prophylaxis they will be requiring penicillin prophylaxis, okay. And remember, it is not a communicable disease, right. And it is a immunological hypersensitivity, right. It is immunological hypersensitivity. And what type of hypersensitivity reaction is this? This will be a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction, right. This will be the type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, just one minute, one minute.
all right so this rheumatic fever the type of hypersensitivity reaction is type 2 hypersensitivity reaction now in case of rheumatic fever you see this question very important that is most of the manifestations of acute rheumatic fever presents approximately 3 weeks after the precipitating group a streptococcal infection which manifestation may present several months after the precipitating infection chorea erythema marginatum fever polyarthritis subcutaneous nodules so what do you think is the late manifestation right very good himanshu that is the chorea the chorea is the late manifestation now what is the name of the criteria the name of the criteria is the jones criteria right so in 2015 the jones criteria have been modified into <coughs> like major and minor is there but they have divided that into the low risk population and as well as the high risk population in case of low risk population the chance of development of rheumatic fever is less and as the word tells you in high risk population the chance of rheumatic fever is more and all in case of major manifestation what all will be there that is arthritis carditis right erythema marginatum then chorea okay chorea then subcutaneous nodules all these will be there in low risk and high risk but the point of difference is the joint involvement the point of difference is the joint involvement in case of low risk you should have polyarthritis only whereas in moderate and high risk population right in these individuals either monoarthritis is sufficient to call it as major criteria or polyarthritis or polyarthralgia is also suff uh, sufficient to call it as the high risk criteria then you take minor criteria even in minor criteria again we have low risk population high risk population so low risk population again the joint involvement polyarthralgia is required for low risk and moderate to high risk you require the monoarthralgia then the next is the esr right the next is the esr so esr it should be more than 60 mm right more than 60 mm in one hour in case of low risk more than 30 mm in one hour in the moderate and the high risk population okay right so this is how you will differentiate the low risk and as well as high risk population and the other minor criteria are fever more than 38.5 degree centigrade and the pr interval is being prolonged and what is the most common earliest manifestation most common earliest manifestation will be the arthritis see arthritis will develop within 2 weeks and the arthritis here is the non erosive arthritis right rarely you get a deformity that is called jacquard's arthropathy right that is called jacquard's arthropathy see this is what is your jacquard's arthropathy but very rarely you get this jacquard's arthropathy which is nothing but where you have the ulnar deviation and the joints which are being affected here is mainly the lower limb joints and the the description of the arthritis is migratory polyarthritis that means the inflammation will be there within one joint for one week and after that the inflammation will completely subside in that joint next it will shift to the other joint so that is what is called as the migratory polyarthritis okay so and in these patients with arthritis what is the drug of choice the drug of choice for uh, arthritis will be the aspirin that too we give high dose aspirin and in those individuals who are like uh, having development of adverse effects with aspirin see what is the development of adverse effect with aspirin development of ray syndrome so those individuals who are developing ray syndrome in them you can give an alternative nsaid that is naproxen can be given right and what exactly is ray syndrome ray syndrome is that where there is development of worsening brain and as well as liver toxicity what will be that brain pathology the brain pathology will be in the form of the seizures loss of consciousness and liver pathology will be in the form of liver toxicity where they can have the jaundice okay and this ray syndrome it usually begins shortly after the recovery from the viral infection such as the influenza or chicken pox and about 90% of cases in children they are associated with the aspirin use the development of ray syndrome in children is mainly secondary to the aspirin use so those individuals who have developed ray syndrome you need to give the alternative agent that is naproxen can be given right so this is about your major and as well as minor criteria according to your jones right next and you need to know the valvular involvement so what is the earliest valvular lesion in case of acute rheumatic fever so this is one of the pyq the earliest valvular lesion please remember that may be the mitral regurgitation but if the question is asked what is the most common 
valvular lesion right what is the most common valvular lesion in case of the chronic rheumatic heart disease yeah himanshu i'll tell you the treatment just wait for a minute i'll tell you the treatment see in case of chronic rheumatic heart disease that will be the mitral stenosis chronic rheumatic heart disease it is mitral stenosis whereas the acute rheumatic fever it is the mitral regurgitation uh, that will be the valvular pathology and the valve which is least commonly affected will be the pulmonary valve will be pulmonary valve then how do you treat these patients so right for courier you take this rheumatic courier you take this rheumatic courier if the patient is having mild form of involuntary movements we don't give any drug just provide calm environment that will suffice but in moderate cases of the courier these patients they will be requiring the carbamazepine or valproic acid so carbamazepine or valproic acid is preferred over haloperidol but whereas in severe form of the chorea or refractory forms of chorea those patients they require the steroids that is how you will treat this particular chorea right then followed by that in some cases in extremely severe forms of chorea not responding to any of these drugs small studies have suggested the role of intravenous immunoglobulin this intravenous immunoglobulin can have rapid resolution of the chorea manifestation okay so that is about the treatment in case of the chorea now coming to the antibiotic prophylaxis see the antibiotic prophylaxis that we give is the benzathine penicillin and this benzathine penicillin you need to give 1.2 million units and in which group of individuals you give this 1.2 million units deep im if the weight of the individual is more than 27 kg is you need to give 1.2 million units intramuscularly every 3 to 4 weeks but if the weight of the individual is or if the weight of the child is less than 27 kg you need to give exactly half of it that is 0.6 million that is 6 lakh units that is you need to give and those patients who are allergic to penicillin in them you need to give sulfadiazine or erythromycin is being given and next important is for how long you need to give the prophylaxis right for how long you need to give this prophylaxis see it all depends upon the individual manifestation if the patient is having rheumatic fever without carditis then you give it for 5 years after the last episode or 21 years of age whichever is longer that is rheumatic fever without carditis but if the patient is having carditis but residual valvular involvement is not there hmm? residual valvular involvement is not there then in such case you give 10 years after the last attack or 21 years of age whichever is longer but if the patient is having persistent valvular disease right persistent valvular disease in such case you need to give this benzathine penicillin for 10 years after the last attack or 40 years of age whichever is longer and sometimes lifelong prophylaxis is being given so this is about the story related to rheumatic fever so with this we are done with the topics related to cardiology so in the cardiology we are done with each and every topic right once we are done with the cardiology the next important topic for today will be the respiratory system okay so now let us move on to the discussion of the uh, pulmonology quick revision right <clears throat> okay so if you take this pulmonology quick revision the first important topic is the very important emergency in the pulmonology that is the ARDS acute respiratory distress syndrome so in ARDS what is a very very important point is that is non cardiogenic pulmonary edema that means your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be absolutely normal and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure you measure with the help of swan gans catheter right you measure with the help of swan gans catheter and what is the most common cause of ARDS the most common cause of ARDS overall will be the sepsis and most common cause of direct lung injury causing ARDS that will be pneumonia whereas most common cause of indirect lung injury causing ARDS that will be sepsis again that will be sepsis again okay right now you see this question normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with pulmonary edema is seen in now you should know among this the one which will be causing ARDS so left atrial myxoma high altitude pulmonary venous obstruction pulmonary arterial obstruction the one which can cause ARDS in this patient is high altitude and in these patients you will have normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with 
pulmonary edema. So the difference between non-cardiogenic and cardiogenic is that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So here it will be normal and here it will be elevated. And how much is the normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? That is around 6 to 12 millimeters of mercury. And we measure that with the help of the uh, swan gans catheter. And in these patients, in both of them, you have the fluid which is present within the lung and where there can be the crypts. And what is the criteria for describing the ARDS is the Berlin's criteria. So you can just remember this mnemonic ARDS itself. The word A stands for the onset of symptoms which is acute. Acute in onset. That is the symptoms developed within one week of the clinical insult. The symptoms developed within one week of the clinical insult. The word R stands for reduced PaO2 by FiO2. And how much will be that? Less than 200. And D stands for right diffuse bilateral opacities on the chest x-ray so how will be the chest x-ray you will have a complete white out lung so that is what is your diffuse bilateral opacities on the chest x-ray and the word s stands for the swan gans catheter showing the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of less than 18 so even though we the normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is around 6 to 12 but the cutoff what we take is the 18 millimeters of mercury and depending upon your pao2 by fio2 value we assess the cvrt of the ards so you take in mild the PaO2 by FiO2 will be around 200 to 300. Whereas in moderate, the PaO2 by FiO2 will be 100 to 200. Whereas in severe, the PaO2 by FiO2 will be less than 100 millimeters of mercury. So that is how you will assess the CVRT of the ARDS. And this will be the chest X-ray in patients with ARDS where you have diffuse bilateral opacities, which we describe this as complete white out lung. Now, these are some of the important points in ARDS. Most common cause of ARDS is sepsis. They will have normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. The type of edema will be non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And this edema contains high protein content, right? And there is intrapulmonary shunting. That is from pulmonary capillaries, the shunt will be there into the alveoli. That we call as the intrapulmonary shunting. PaO2 by FiO2 will be less than 200. The chest X-ray will show you bilateral white out lung. And the treatment of choice will be the mechanical ventilator or low volume ventilation using continuous positive airway pressure. Okay. So, and this mechanical ventilatory settings are very, very important. You require to give the low tidal volume. And how much will be the tidal volume? That is around 6 ml per kg. And you require to give an adequate PEEP, that is positive end expiratory pressure. And how much should be that? That is around 10 millimeters of mercury. And most of the times, these patients are managed in the prone position rather than the supine position. So why? Because there will be re recruitment of the dependent lung zones when you make the individual to lie down in prone position and manage. Okay. So this is about the important points related to ARDS. Now you need to differentiate the chest X-ray in case of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema that is ARDS from the cardiogenic pulmonary edema. In non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you will have diffuse bilateral pulmonary opacities. That means Throughout the lung, you are having this opacity. But in case of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you have this characteristic bat wing appearance. That means the perihilar interstitial infiltrates or alveolar infiltrate will be there. So that is what is the characteristic bat wing appearance in case of the cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Right Now, after having discussed about the ARDS, the next important topic for the discussion or revision will be the COPD, that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you have two important components. One is chronic bronchitis and the other one is the emphysema. And what type of disease is your chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? As the word itself tells you, it's an OLD. So how can you tell that it is an OLD? That is by your pulmonary function test. What will the pulmonary function test do? Uh, will be in case of OLD? That is your FEV1 by FVC will be less than 70% in case of the obstructive uh, lung disease, right? Now, what is the name of the criteria to decide the CVRT of your COPD is the GOLD criteria. So, what does this GOLD stands for? The word GOLD stands for Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease, right? Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease. So, to call it as very severe COPD, according to the GOLD criteria, what exactly is the answer? So, your FEV1 by FVC will be reduced in all the forms, mild, moderate, severe, very severe, everything in your FEV1 by FVC will be reduced. That is less than 0.7 or less than 70%. But how much should be your FEV1 
to call it as very severe COPD. So to call it as very severe COPD, your FEV1 should be less than 30%. That is the point when we call it as the very severe COPD. And remember, your COPD, it is the disease of the smaller airways. Now, what is the definition of the smaller airway? Definition of smaller airway is that when the internal diameter of the airway, if it is less than 2 mm and there is absence of the cartilage, right, there is absence of the cartilage, then we call it as the smaller airways. So, non cartilaginous airways and internal diameter less than 2 mm, we call it as the smaller airways. And where do the smaller airways start from? See, we have totally 23 regenerations of airways. From 8th generation onwards, distally up to the alveoli, right, from 8th generation onwards, distally up to the alveoli, you have the smaller airways, right. We call it as the smaller airways. Now, what are all the examples for your smaller airway disease? It is not only COPD. There are many other conditions like the hypersensitivity pneumonitis, that is also a smaller airway disease. Then, bronchiolitis that is also the smaller airway disease then mineral dust pneumoconiosis right mineral dust pneumoconiosis that is also the smaller airway disease okay so these are the examples of the smaller airway diseases now very important point of discussion in the copd <coughs> is about the chronic bronchitis in chronic bronchitis they'll have cough with mucoid expectoration for consecutively two years for three months Right, so every year three months, like consecutively two years, they'll have cough with mucoid expectoration. Now, in these patients with chronic bronchitis, why is that you have that mucoid expectoration? That is because of the hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the mucous glands. So we calculate the read index to assess the CVRT of the chronic bronchitis. And how do you calculate this read index? It is the ratio of thickness of the submucosal glands. Right, it is the ratio of thickness of the submucosal glands to that of the entire thickness of the bronchial wall, right, to that of the entire thickness of the bronchial wall, that is what is called the read index. And how much is the normal value of your read index? Normal value of your read index is 0.44 plus or minus 0.09. But whereas in patients with a chronic bronchitis, the read index, it is around 0 0.52 plus or minus 0.08. Right? So, that will be the read index in case of chronic bronchitis. Why more is your hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the submucosal glands, more will be your read index in case of chronic bronchitis and that will tell you the CVRT of chronic bronchitis. Right? And what is the important risk factor for the development of chronic bronchitis is the cigarette smoking. Right? Next, then you need to know about the emphysema. So, emphysema, not only cigarette smoking, the other important factor which is responsible for development of emphysema is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, right? This alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is associated with which type of emphysema? It is associated with pan asinar emphysema and this centri asinar emphysema, it is very commonly seen in smokers, right? Commonly seen in smokers. Now, what do you understand by this word, the pan asinar emphysema? The pan asinar emphysema is that it is the entire asinus is abnormally irreversibly dilated. What are all the parts of the asinus? Respiratory bronchiole will be there, alveolar duct will be there, alveolar sac will be there and alveoli will be there. So these four parts, respiratory bronchiole, alveolar duct, alveolar sac and alveoli, everything will be abnormally irreversibly dilated that is called as the pan asinar emphysema that is seen in patients with the alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. Whereas, you take in case of centri asinar emphysema, what did I tell you? It is the one which is commonly seen in smokers and in centri asinar emphysema, it is only the respiratory bronchioles which are abnormally irreversibly dilated. In case of the centri asinar emphysema, the distal part of the asinus, right, the distal part of the asinus, that is alveolar sac and alveoli, they are not abnormally irreversibly dilated. It is only the respiratory bronchial which is abnormally irreversibly dilated in case of the centri asinar emphysema. Then next we have paraseptal emphysema. See, in case of paraseptal emphysema, it is the distal part of the asinus which is abnormally irreversibly dilated, right? And what is the distal part of the asinus? That will be your alveolar sac, alveoli and alveolar duct. So, alveolar duct, alveolar sac, and then alveoli. These are abnormally irreversibly dilated in paraseptal emphysema and which part of the lung is commonly affected in paraseptal emphysema is the peripheral part of the lung and these asinus if they rupture 
the individual may develop the pneumothorax. The individual may develop pneumothorax. Now, see, in chronic bronchitis, the common presentation will be in the form of cough with expectoration. But whereas in emphysema, the most common presentation will be in the form of dyspnea. Right? And how do you classify this particular CVRT of dyspnea? In case of cardiology, we have discussed as NYHA, that is New York Heart Association. But whereas here, it is Modified Medical Research Council, that is MMRC Council for uh, scale for assessment of CVRT of dyspnea. So where you have grade 0 to grade 4. Grade 0 is that where the individual can breathe, right? There is no breathlessness in grade 0. But breathlessness will be there only on strenuous exercise. But while doing ordinary activity or less than ordinary activity, there is no breathlessness. But when the individual does strenuous activity, then there will be breathlessness that is grade 0. And what is grade 4? Grade 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Grade 4 is that the individual will have dyspnea at rest. So that is what is your MMRC. Now, the next thing is how will you diagnose your COPD? Diagnosis of your COPD is by your pulmonary function test where you have the FEV1, right, where you have FEV1 by FVC which is being reduced less than 70%. FEV1 by FVC is being reduced less than 70%. That is what is the pulmonary function test in patients with the obstructive lung disease. Emphysema is what? It's an obstructive lung disease, right? So in emphysema and as well as chronic bronchitis, you have your FEV1 by FVC less than 70%. And the other methods by which you can diagnose your emphysema and chronic bronchitis is by chest x-ray. So, what will the chest x-ray show? Chest x-ray will show you that there is bilateral hyperlucent lung fields. Right? Bilateral hyperlucent lung fields. And these particular lungs which are hyperinflated, they overlap the heart and thereby it, the heart appears as the tubular heart. And these lungs which are abnormally irreversibly dilated, they compress the diaphragm. So, thereby you have the low set diaphragm. Then you also have the presence of blebs, right? And these blebs, when they rupture, they can develop pneumothorax, right? And the other, the, if you take the chest x-ray in case of chronic bronchitis, in chronic bronchitis, you will notice that there is increased bronchovascular markings, right? There is increased bronchovascular markings. So when will you call increased bronchovascular markings? When bronchovascular markings are present beyond two-thirds, right? When bronchovascular markings are present beyond two-thirds of your uh, lung field, then we call it as the prominent bronchovascular markings. And what is the criteria to assess the CVRT of your COPD? That is the gold criteria. And what is the parameter that we take into consideration for assessing the CVRT is, that is FEV1, right, FEV1. So when do you call mild COPD, right, you call it as mild COPD when your FEV1 percentage or FEV1 is more than 80 percentage of the predicted value and when do you call it as moderate COPD that is when your FEV1 if it is around 50 to 79 percentage of the predicted value and when will you assess the when will you call it as severe COPD when your FEV1 if it is around 30 to 49 percentage of the predicted value we call it as severe COPD and when do you call it as the very severe COPD? Very severe COPD, we call it as when your FEV1 is less than 30 percentage of the predicted value. And accordingly, we decide the treatment in patients with the COPD. In case of your mild, we just give only short-acting beta agonist, that is your salbutamol and as well as terbutalin. But whereas in case of moderate, we add lava. What is lava? That is salmetrol and as well as formetrol. Whereas in case of severe form of COPD, that is the point when we had inhaled corticosteroid, right? We add inhaled corticosteroid. Whereas in very severe form of COPD, we need to add long-term oxygen, right? We need to add long-term oxygen along with all these. That is what we do in case of severe COPD. So this is what is your gold criteria. So what do you understand by this word gold? That is global initiative for obstructive lung disease. That is what is your gold criteria, right? Now, so after having discussed about COPD, which is one of the obstructive lung disease, the next important form of the obstructive lung disease for quick revision is the bronchial asthma. So bronchial asthma is also an obstructive lung disease, right? This is also an obstructive lung disease. Now, what is the difference between COPD and as well as bronchial asthma? Bronchial asthma, you will have 
reversible airway disease but whereas COPD it is an irreversible airway disease that is the important point of difference between these two. Now you take in bronchial asthma like what are the important features which one of the following value is not a feature of acute severe asthma pulses paradoxes PAO2 less than kilopascals 8 kilopascals okay you multiply it by 7 you get it in millimeters of mercury and heart rate more than 110 peak expiratory flow rate 60 to 70 percentage of the expected value so which among this is not the feature of the acute severe asthma yes anyone want to make an attempt of this question so in case of the acute severe form of asthma which is nothing but your status asthmaticus you will have pulses paradoxes and what will happen to your pao2 value the pao2 value will be reduced and how much will be that pao2 value that will be reduced in case of the acute severe form of asthma or in case of severe form of asthma the pao2 value will be less than 40 percent but here it is around 56 millimeters of mercury and the heart rate more than uh, uh, 110 right that is a true statement but which of the following is not the feature? I'm sorry, one second, one second, one second. So it should be less than 60%. PAO2 less than 60%. Okay. Right. Here it is 56, which is the correct point. Now, which is not seen is the peak expiratory flow rate. How much should be the peak expiratory flow rate in case of the severe form of the asthma? The peak expiratory flow rate should be less than 25% if it is like status asthmaticus. And if it is just, old, see, what is the difference between status asthmaticus and severe is, status asthmaticus, it is acute, very severe form of asthma, where your peak expiratory flow rate is less than 25%. But if your peak expiratory flow rate, if it is like 25 to 40%, we call it as the severe form of asthma. Okay, so which of the following is not the feature of acute severe asthma now? That will be your uh, peak expiratory flow rate, 60 to 70 percentage of the predicted value, that is the incorrect statement. Now, in patients with bronchial asthma, if you take the airways, the airways, you know, they are thick and as well as inflamed and this particular airways, they contain the abnormal substances. You will have like V's because of the thickening of the airways, the classical presentation in case of bronchial asthma will be V's. Along with V's, you will have cough with expectoration. Right, you will have cough with expectoration. Now, what will the expectoration in case of the asthma will be right it contains the Kirschman spirals what are Kirschman spirals that is the spiral shaped mucus plugs right the presence of the spiral shaped mucus plugs that will be the Kirschman spirals then what are the criola bodies the criola bodies are that is sloughed ciliated columnar cells right sloughed Ciliated columnar cells that will be your criola bodies and lastly you have charcoal laden crystals. Charcoal laden crystals like how, will, how they will be they are like slender and pointed at both ends. Right they are slender and pointed at both ends consisting of a pair of the hexagonal pyramids and what are the conditions where you can have this charcoal laden crystals is apart from asthma you can have that in other eosinophilic inflammatory pathologies like parasitic infection like entamoeba histolytica you can have this charcoal laden crystals so these are the three important features that you will have in sputum that is kirschman spirals criola bodies and as well as the charcoal laden crystals now you need to know a few important points about the status asthmaticus or the acute severe asthma so these patients they cannot speak because of the severe respiratory distress and if at all if they want to speak they can just speak single words that is they speak in monosyllables and the respiratory rate will be definitely be elevated that is more than 30 per minute and these patients the characteristic pulse will be that is pulses paradoxes will be there then how will be the ronchi the ronchi in these individuals will be the loud ronchi right loud ronchi and these patients they develop type 2 respiratory failure because carbon dioxide washout does not occur because of severe bronchospasm so that will result in the hypoxia and as well as the hypercapnia that is what is nothing but your type 2 respiratory failure now what will be the drug of choice in these individuals drug of choice in these individuals will be short acting beta agonist that is salbutamol nebulization should be taken and other drugs that we give is 
we give the intravenous hydrocortisone and next the oxygen supplementation. So this will be the treatment uh, options in case of status asthmatic test or acute severe asthma. Then we have another important variant of asthma that is called brittle asthma. What is this brittle asthma? Some patients, they show chaotic variation in lung function despite taking appropriate therapy. So how much will be that chaotic variation? The diurnal variation of peak expiratory flow rate more than 40%. See, early in the morning, if you take the peak expiratory flow rate, it is something like 80%. And later in the evening, if you see peak expiratory flow rate, if it is like something 30%, that means your peak expiratory flow rate is reduced more than 40%, then we call it as the brittle asthma. And this brittle asthma, we have two types, type 1 and as well as type 2 brittle asthma. Type 1 brittle asthma is that shows a persistent pattern of variability. Right? There will be persistent pattern of variability and these patients, they require the oral steroids. Right? These patients, they require the oral steroids. Whereas type 2 brittle asthma is that where the individual will have near normal lung function, right? Normal or near normal lung function, but there will be precipitous, unpredictable fall in the lung function, right? Precipitous, unpredictable fall of the lung function. That we call it as the type 2 brittle asthma. And here the drug of choice will be the subcutaneous adrenaline. Right, subcutaneous adrenaline. Okay, now how is your asthma diagnosed? The asthma is being diagnosed by your FEV1. So, what is the role of this FEV1 is mainly in the spirometry that will assess the reversibility status. That will assess the reversibility status. That means, right, that means you have to check the baseline FEV1, then you need to give salbutamol labelization. And you have to check, wait for 10 to 15 minutes. So once you get one is you get a baseline. Second is after giving salbutamol nebulization, wait for 10 to 15 minutes. Right? Then you check the FEV1. If suppose if the FEV1, if it is increased more than 12% or more than 200 ml, this suggests that the patient is suffering with bronchial asthma. And if it is less than 12% or less than 200 ml increase, then we call it as the COPD. Then we call it as the COPD, that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now, depending upon your FEV1 value percentage, we assess the CVRT of COPD, right? What is that? If the uh, FEV1, if it is more than 70%, then we call it as mild, right? And if the FEV1, if it is around 40 to 69%, then we call it as the moderate. And if the FEV1 value, if it is less than 40%, we call it as the severe. And if it is less than 25%, then we call it as the very severe. Right? We call it as the very severe. Okay? So, these are the various forms of asthma and their respective classification depending upon your pulmonary function test. Right? Now, I'll just show you some questions here. So, treatment like what will be the treatment like you need to give the stepwise approach. If it is like mild asthma, you need to give short acting beta agonist. Then, if it is mild persistent along with short acting beta agonist, you also need to add the steroids, inhaled steroids. Whereas in moderate persistent, you need to give inhaled steroids, theophylline, and then inhaled beta 2 agonist. Then, severe persistent asthma, you need to give oral steroids. Okay. Now, you see this question here. A known asthmatic presented to emergency department with severe exacerbation not relieved by salbutamol. Patient was given corticosteroid and aminophilin. What is the rationale of giving corticosteroid? No, no, no. So, your uh, corticosteroids, they don't have the bronchodilatory activity. Right? And they don't decrease, increase the mucociliary clearance. The advantage is that the corticosteroids, they facilitate the beta 2 agonist. Right? They facilitate the beta 2 agonist. Okay? That is what is the importance of the corticosteroids. Why we need to give along with the beta 2 agonist. So, this completes the discussion of the bronchial asthma. Then, next important topic for the quick revision is the cystic fibrosis, which is also an obstructive lung disease. Which is also an obstructive lung disease. So, this cystic fibrosis, it is an inherited disorder. And the type of inheritance is autosomal recessive type of inheritance and it is a multi-system disorder. 
the first signs and symptoms they typically occur in the childhood right they typically occur within the childhood and what is the gene that is being mutated for the development of your uh, cystic fibrosis is that is the CFTR gene that is being mutated and this CFTR gene is present on the chromosome 7 right it is present on chromosome 7 now what will be the clinical presentation in neonates in neonates the presentation will be in the form of the meconium ileus hmm? where the meconium is unable to come out of the GAT of the individual and how will you take out that uh, feces that is by enema and that particular enema will be gastrographin enema right that enema will be the gastrographin enema and these patients the mucus secretions they are very thick mucus secretions and this thick mucus secretions they make the individual to develop the recurrent pneumonia because that organism will come and get stuck within the mucus and that can cause the infection and that is what is responsible for your recurrent pneumonia then you take the bronchiectasis bronchiectasis mainly involves the upper lung fields right bronchiectasis mainly involves the upper lung fields okay right because these patients with cystic fibrosis they develop bronchiectasis and which form which part of the lung is being affected in case of cystic fibrosis by bronchiectasis that is the upper lung fields then you take the biliary fluid secretion even your biliary fluid secretion it also becomes very thick when the biliary fluid secretion becomes thick that is the point when they develop what is called secondary biliary cirrhosis right and this secondary biliary cirrhosis there can be even the formation of the gallstones then next is the osmotic diarrhea why is that you get this osmotic diarrhea see pancreatic juice contains an enzyme called amylase which is responsible for sugar absorption but what has happened to pancreatic juice in cystic fibrosis the pancreatic juice has become thick and thereby there is fall in the serum amylase levels once the pancreatic uh, amylase levels are reduced then the sugar absorption will be reduced so that will and the sugar which is present within the GAT will secrete the fluid into the GAT and thereby there can be development of diarrhea and that we call it as the osmotic diarrhea right osmotic diarrhea next important point is the infertility so why is that there will be infertility in males sorry in females the infertility is because of increase in the cervical mucus thickness right increase in the cervical mucus thickness but whereas in males why is that there is infertility in cystic fibrosis that is because of development of azoospermia right azoospermia is caused due to agenesis of the vas deferens hmm? agenesis of vas deferens and another so investigations if you take that is number one the sweat chloride concentration that will be right that will be more than 60 milli equivalents per uh, liter on two occasions and you can have false positive elevation of your sweat chloride in case of the addisons then the investigation of choice will be the genetic analysis that is cftr mutation analysis should be done right that is by using exonic sequencing then what is the treatment you need to give targeted therapies see targeted therapies include several drugs that modulate cftr trafficking that will modulate cftr folding that will modulate the cftr function so what are those the targeted therapies these targeted therapies they include the ivacaftor right they include the ivacaftor which is a potential of the cftr channel and what are the other drugs which can improve the cftr protein folding that is Luma cafter, then Tiza cafter, then Elixa cafter. So these are the targeted therapies that you need to give in these individuals, right? And next is lastly the lung transplantation. Lung transplantation is the only, right? Lung transplantation is only the definitive treatment for advanced cystic fibrosis, right? And what is that you need to do? Not only lung transplantation, it should be double. Right? Double lung heart transplantation should be done in case of the cystic fibrosis. So, this completes the discussion of cystic fibrosis, which is an obstructive lung disease. And one more important obstructive lung disease will be the bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is also an obstructive lung disease. And which particular generations are irreversibly dilated in bronchiectasis? That is fifth to ninth generation, which is abnormally irreversibly dilated in case of the bronchiectasis. And you need to know that 
bronchiectasis is more common in which lobe bronchiectasis it is more common in the left lower lobe because the airway going to the left lower limb like it is very longer so that is the reason why bronchiectasis is more common in the left lower lobe and depending upon the shape of abnormally irreversibly dilated bronchi we classify the bronchiectasis into three types cylindrical sacular and cystic out of which the most common will be the cylindrical form of the bronchiectasis right now you should know what is the condition where you will have mid lung field bronchiectasis mid lung field bronchiectasis is seen in mycobacterium avium infection abpa tuberculosis post radiation fibrosis so the answer is mycobacterium avium infection now let me tell you what are all the conditions where you will have the upper lobe bronchiectasis upper lobe bronchiectasis you come across this in tuberculosis cystic fibrosis then allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and even post radiation fibrosis then what is the condition where you will have mid lung bronchiectasis that is what is our question that is mycobacterium avium infections and even the immotile cilia syndrome lower lung bronchiectasis you come across this in case of chronic recurrent aspiration so chronic recurrent aspiration can cause the lower lung bronchiectasis central bronchiectasis is that you come across in case of the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and as well as the cystic fibrosis these are the two conditions where you can have the central bronchiectasis then what are the, what is the workup one is your sputum analysis when you do a sputum examination by keeping the sputum bedside you get this classical three layered sputum where the upper layer upper layer it is like completely frothy and watery the middle layer is that which contain the turbid and mucopurulent material and lower layer is that which contains the purulent and as well as which gives the opaque nature of the three layered sputum then what is the first line investigation is chest x ray chest x ray may be normal or it will give you the classical tram track appearance in classical tram track appearance but what is the most accurate investigation the most accurate investigation will be the hrct that is high resolution ct scan see high resolution ct scan is that which will give you the classical description of the appearance of abnormally irreversibly dilated bronchi right so what is this description considered as this description of the hrct is considered as the tree in bud appearance tree in bud appearance and one more important is the development of the signet ring sign right the development of the signet ring sign so that is what is the ct scan picture in patients with the bronchiectasis and if you want to visualize the bronchus then you need to do bronchography then how do you treat these patients see for the treatment of the uh, massive hemoptysis you need to do bronchial artery embolization right you need to do bronchial artery embolization so this completes the discussion of your obstructive lung diseases what all we have discussed that is your asthma then bronchitis or bronchiectasis then cystic fibrosis or copd so we are done with the discussion of the obstructive lung diseases right so today i'll just wind up at this particular point and tomorrow i will continue the remaining part of the pulmonology and tomorrow we will take up the discussion mcqs on the infectious diseases we will do some mcqs on the hematology right and the next important topic for quick revision is gastroenterology so tomorrow we'll do the remaining part of the pulmonology then gastroenterology small topic infectious disease mcqs and hematology mcqs so with this i'll wind up this particular session and see you tomorrow again at 7 pm thank you very much